Yes. Thank you. Good evening. It is August 7th, 2023. This is a regular meeting of the town council. However, it is being held totally on Zoom. The open meeting law has been extended. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and their live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the August 7, 2023 town council meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. I'll call upon each councilor to make sure that they can hear us and we can hear them. And at that point, please remember to then mute again. Um, hold on. Okay. Uh, Shalini Bon Milne. Not yet. Okay, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Anna, something's going on with your. Sorry, you... here, Thank I'm you. present. Got it. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. I'm here. Pam Rooney. I'm here. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Here. And I do recall in an earlier poll that I don't believe Shalini can be with us. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Paul or me know. To make a comment or ask a question, please use the raised hand function. If te technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, we'll decide how to address the situation. Uh, and I'll be monitoring council's co counselor connections. And if necessary, we will pause the meeting until you are reconnected. There is no change in the order of the agenda as posted. With all of that said, I want to particularly ask both the audience and the counselors for your patience tonight. We are holding this meet meeting without the assistant of our assistance of our outstanding clerk to the town council. Kelly, who is planning to be with us to take minutes. Paul will be posting the motions within 24 hours. Anna will be managing the slides and I will manage the meeting, including the timer. So um, that's kind of how it's gonna go. Uh, we do, I just wanna check uh, whether or not Kelly is in the audience and she is not. Okay, so we're recording the meeting and that is sufficient. Um, we're going to go to the announcements. Uh, Anna, please put them up. I want to particularly call attention to the fact that we have council meetings coming up on the 21st, September 11th, and actually September 18th as well. Uh, various committee meetings will be held, and prior to this agenda being posted, or since this agenda was posted, the Finance Committee has set a meeting date of August 22nd at 3.30. Um, we're done with that. We're going to go to general public comment. And if you have to, would like to make general public comment, please raise your hand now. Okay, right now I'm seeing I'm seeing, I'm not seeing any hands at all. Um, there are six folks with their hands up. Okay, Anna, I don't know why I'm not seeing them. There we are. Okay, uh, 
we're going to start. And again, I'm just going to ask for people's patience as we move forward tonight because we do not have our usual clerk of the town council. Uh, Paul, would you please bring, so let me just go on. This is general public comment and it is the only public comment this evening. Uh, since we are meeting in totally virtual mode tonight, all comments will be through Zoom. We've already asked people to raise their hands if they are in Zoom and residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. The committee will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. With that, I'm going to call on Peggy Matthews Nelson. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Peggy, you need to unmute. Paul, you may have to ask her to unmute. There we go. Hi. Okay. Hi, we can hear you. Good, good start. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Peggy Matthews Nilsson, District 5, and I'm speaking in support of the dark skies friendly streetlight policy. Light pollution is, a devastate, is devastating to the natural world. We humans are just one part of the natural world, but are inseparable from it. Light pollution of our skies negatively affects the natural circadian rhythm of all forms of life, from plants to salamanders, to migrating birds, to pollinating insects, to bats and humans. The human health risks of disrupted sleep patterns are well documented. The impact of disrupted patterns on other species is becoming clearer as our environment becomes more and more out of balance. When you consider the impact of light pollution on human health and the well being of other species that humans rely upon, the costs of light pollution far outweigh any benefit to the environment from adding more streetlights in an attempt to <clears throat> induce more people to bike, walk, or take the bus. Instead, reducing the glare of existing streetlights by using new low lumen, low glare 2200K lights in streetlights will better will result in better visibility for drivers, bicyclists, walkers, and runners, and will also help keep our skies darker for everyone. Instead of expecting all the streets to be brightly lit, it makes far better sense to reduce the glare of existing streetlights, which is almost certainly responsible for a significant number of bike and pedestrian crashes, and to encourage common sense bike and pedestrian safety measures. Cyclists can use state mandated bike lights and wear reflective clothing. Pedestrians can carry cheap portable LED lights for visibility. The rest of the natural world relies upon us humans to make wise decisions based upon our understanding of science and the impact of our technology <clears throat> on the natural world. For these reasons, I urge members of the town council to support the dark sky friendly streetlight policy. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We will now bring Eve Vogel in, please. Eve, please state your name and where you live. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Good. All right. My name is Eve Vogel. I live on Harlow Drive off of East Pleasant. I served for over 10 years on town transportation committees, have driven, walked, biked, and ridden the bus in Amherst for 15 years. I'm also a geography faculty member at UMass, formerly an ecologist, and have worked on the careful balance of ecosystem protection with human use and infrastructure for decades. I strongly support efforts to reduce unnecessary nighttime lighting. Natural lighting and natural darkness are good for plants, people, and other animals. And I also strongly support strategic street lighting for safety and comfort especially for pedestrians, bicyclists, and other vulnerable users of our sidewalks and street shoulders. My largest single effort in 15 years in Amherst has been to find ways to promote a transportation mode shift in which more people walk, bike, or use transit for short trips rather than a car. 
A transportation mode shift reduces resource and energy use, reduces traffic and parking congestion, increases public health, and increases patronage of local businesses. Currently in Massachusetts, the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions is transportation, so a transportation mode shift is also crucial for our efforts to combat climate change. I am excited about the streetlights policy proposal because improved streetlights are essential for a transportation mode shift in Amherst. I thank Councillors Haneke and Devlin Gautier for putting so much time and attention on a topic that can seem boring, but is important to many purposes. However, unfortunately, the proposal is not ready. It has been improved since June, but it remains one-sided. As currently written, it will worsen nighttime safety in Amherst and obstruct a transportation mode shift. I ask you to postpone the vote and make revisions to get this policy right. To understand the benefits, dangers, and opportunities, let's focus on four streets. First, downtown, Pleasant Street. Shielded lights, warm color, colors, pedestrian scale, and frequently placed lights make for a win-win situation, protection of dark skies and pedestrian safety. This is a place where the current policy will work well. Second, my street, Harlow Drive, not a through street. Traffic is limited and relatively slow. It could be great to shield the lights and warm their color, prioritizing dark sky protections over safety lighting rules. Many people in my neighborhood already do wear lights when they walk around. They are long-term residents. In these two neighborhoods, the current policy, as it stands, is already positive. Now think about North Pleasant, north of campus. This is a major corridor for students walking to and from UMass after class in the winter to get pizza at night or home from parties at 2 a.m. Shielding lights and making colors warmer without adding additional lamps will mean less of the sidewalk and roadway is lighted. This is already a route that has one of the highest crash rates in the Eve, town. Eve, we need you to finish up, thank you. Okay, and it's also the site of a fatality a few years ago because a driver did not see a graduate student crossing the street after he got off the bus. The current policy without revisions will make this street more dangerous. Finally, East Pleasant, no sidewalks north of Olympia Drive. Many people, but not very many, take the bus, walk and um, bike on this route but more will do it if the lights are not intermittent. They will become more intermittent, less light, and more dangerous if this policy is passed. I ask the council to pause, make important revisions, and achieve both dark skies and safety for the future of the town. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Tracy Zafian, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Um, okay, hi. Hi, I'm in the room now. Okay, great. Okay. Um, okay, um, thank you. My name is Tracy Zafian. I live in District 3, just south of Amity Street. I'm currently the chairperson of the Transportation Advisory Committee, though I'm not speaking here tonight on tax behalf. I did send in written comments as well tonight. Um, since the sponsors first presented their proposed policy in August 2022, I've contacted the council numerous times with my concerns about the policy and asked that the policy be revised to better balance the goals of reducing the detrimental impacts of excessive life on human health, which I support, with other tone goals relating to traffic safety, becoming a more age-friendly community, and encouraging more biking and walking to help meet climate action goals. Um, a lot of work has gone into this policy and into revising it in response to the feedback since it first came before the council almost a year ago. I appreciate those changes and the policy now is safer and better than what was first proposed. However, in my view, the current proposal still has a number of significant issues from a process perspective and a traffic safety perspective. And so I encourage the council to postpone its vote accordingly. Um, it is not urgent for the council to vote on the policy at this time. It will likely be years before many of the town's current streetlights reach the end of their useful lifetime and are replaced. And the current streetlights do not have dimming capabilities. There is therefore time to revise the proposed streetlights policy as written to further make it better and safer. Um, I appreciate the goal of reducing light pollution and overly bright lights at night. 
And I am not a fan of glare either, which is noted can contribute to crashes and to drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists having trouble seeing at night. But at the same time, um, my focus, both personally and professionally, is on traffic safety and saving lives. And I see that as paramount. And um, there are so many traffic deaths that occur at night, including over 75% of pedestrian fatalities and 50% of traffic fatalities in general. And in looking at the crash data for Amherst from 2010 to 2023, a majority of the serious accident and fatal crashes have occurred at night. So research has clearly shown that good nighttime street lighting can reduce these fatalities and that the lack of good lighting at night can make it harder for drivers to see pedestrians and other road objects and to respond to them in a timely manner by slowing or yielding. So one of the earlier commenters tonight recommended that the town have light that's no um, warmer than 23, um, 2300 Crazy. Kelvin. You yes? need to catch up. Okay, thank you. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to stress that, I mean, there are things that pedestrians and bicyclists can, as comment, as a commenter said, there are steps that pedestrians and bicyclists can do to improve their own safety, including having lights and having reflective clothing, but not many do that. And it's important that we keep them safe regardless. Um, and I just wanna make a final comment that when the Gazette wrote up the policy, um, that's on the agenda tonight. It discussed how the policy is designed to increase the lighting on streets with heavy pedestrian and bicycling traffic. And so I just wanted to offer that if that is an, indeed a goal of the policy, that the TAC is available to assist in identifying those streets and evaluating if additional lighting is needed on them. So thank you. One moment, please. Just trying to catch up. Um, uh, James Lowenthal, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello. Hello. My, my name is James Lowenthal. I live in Northampton. I'm professor of astronomy at Smith College, and I'm on the graduate faculty at UMass. I lead the Massachusetts chapter of Dark Sky International, the nonprofit advocacy group based in Tucson, Arizona. I'm involved at the national and international level in the effort to save natural darkness at night from light pollution for the protection of human health and safety, wildlife, heritage and the quality of life, and the starry sky. This is a modern day environmental crisis. Light pollution is growing worse by an astounding 10% per year, far outstripping population growth. We urgently need to act to stop the erosion of natural darkness that all life on Earth needs to thrive. You can see this erosion happening everywhere, including in Amherst where new bright blue glare bombs pop up practically every night on front porches, commercial buildings, streets and parking lots, and schools and other campuses. The proposed lighting policy will help Amherst lead by example and follow national and international best practices in limiting glare, overlighting, and harmful blue light at night on its streets. I also founded the local chapter of MassBike, the statewide bicycle advocacy organization. I'm a lifelong cyclist and pedestrian and advocate for environmentally friendly transportation policy. I use my bike for transportation day and night, summer and winter, including between Northampton and Amherst. I'm very grateful to Eve Vogel, Tracy Zafian, and others for their hard work in supporting bike ped transit. I believe the concerns they've raised, while well-intentioned, are not well-founded. If more light necessarily led to safer streets, then New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, and LA would be the safest places in the world for bicyclists and pedestrians, but they're not. We all know that to use a flashlight, you point the light at the ground, not in your own face. But most of Amherst's current streetlights do just that, blind you with a direct poke in the eye. Many, many fatal bike, ped, car crashes around the US and worldwide are caused every day by this blinding glare from poorly shielded lighting. When my friend and colleague Kate Queenie, resident of Amherst, was struck and nearly killed one night in a crosswalk near Smith, there was plenty of light, but the driver never saw her. I'm sure glare from poorly shielded streetlights was largely to blame. Amherst is no different. Amherst already has way more than enough light, so much that we've already lost the Milky Way from view. That excess light elevates residents' rates of cancer, disrupts their sleep, upsets whole ecosystems, including pollinating insects, and dangerously blinds drivers without providing the safety it promises. Cities and towns that have curbed their light pollution and implemented the same sort of common sense controls proposed here have not seen 
upticks in crime or roadway crashes. Cambridge dims their light after hours. Pepperell installed low glare amber, amber LED streetlights and dims them after midnight. They're now saving money in electricity and the police say they can see better than before. James, you need to finish up, please. Okay, uh, if I could have just a, another few seconds, I'll finish for, briefly. The Federal Highway Administration, National Transportation Safety Board, the League of American Bicyclists, all call for improving bike ped safety, but none of them calls for more street lights. We don't need more light, we need better light. I urge you to support this carefully thought out common sense proposed lighting policy, which has been vetted by professional lighting experts and is consistent with recommendations from both Dark Sky International and the Illuminating Engineering Society. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Rob Kushner, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Am I in the room? You are. Okay, good evening. Uh, Rob Kusner. I'm uh, from Van Meter Drive, just around the corner from uh, one of your earlier commenters. Um, at the moment, I'm actually far away, but uh, I hope to get in a written comment, but let me just briefly summarize, uh, since I listened to all the people tonight, I know all of them, and I know them professionally as well as, uh, <clears throat> are you able to hear, hear me okay? I'm getting a message. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not a professional astronomer, astronomer, but I am an amateur astronomer. I just returned from uh, Antofagasta, Chile, which is home to the largest ground-based uh, optical telescopes on the planet. And I tried to uh, actually see the dark sky there up in the desert, in the uh, Atacama Desert. Unfortunately, I didn't time the trip right. The full moon appeared just as I was hoping to get a view of anything in the sky. I say this only because I'm extremely sympathetic to the idea that we need dark sky. Um, Vince O'Connor, a former town council, excuse me, town meeting member and a recent town council candidate, once summed it up quickly when he introduced a proposal nearly 20 years ago to preserve the dark skies by saying, it's the greatest show on earth. It's been going on for millions, uh, billions of years. And uh, even this coming weekend, we'll have a chance for one of the highlights, the Percy Meteors. I hope I get to see that. 35 years ago, when I came to Amherst, I could see the Milky Way easily from my backyard in the Van Meter Harlow area. That's impossible now. So I'm very sympathetic to the idea of reducing street lighting, especially in the smaller neighborhood streets, like the ones that Eve and I and Peggy live on. And I agree with James. James is a professional astronomer. He has to deal with light and having lights at the low temperature end is very important, okay? So for spectroscopy in particular. I'm also um, a cyclist, year round cyclist, all weather cyclist. I bike on the Nor Norwatic rail trail with no lights at all other than the ones on my bicycle. I just hope someone in front of me is coming on a bicycle will also be doing the same thing. We're not gonna have lights on the Norwatic rail trail. We're not going to have lights on some of the other pads around town. However, some of the streets, East Pleasant Street, North Pleasant Street, Route 9, otherwise known as College Street and Belchertown Road, they all need much better lighting. My question for all of you councillors, given the somewhat divided views we've heard from people who've served the town, as I have, you know, I was a select board member. I served for many, many years on the Transportation Rob, Committee. I need you to finish up. And I'm about to finish. I think we should adopt a policy like this, but take into account some of the concerns that have been raised by other people like Eve, Tracy, and I'll even raise them too. We need to plan better where we locate lights and where even to remove lights. And I hope you'll consider that perhaps giving this a little more time, two weeks, the moon will be new. Maybe it's good to wait until your next meeting to take this up. Thank you for your comments, Rob. Andy Anderson, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, uh, this is Andy Anderson. I am a resident of District 5. So here we are, three months after my last appearance, and with respect to the ranked choice voting implementation required by the town's charter, nothing has been accomplished. As I predicted back in May, 
The Commonwealth Legislature held a hearing in late June on our home rule petition, which has a self-imposed early July deadline for use in this November's elections. And not only did it not get out of committee in time to meet that deadline, it still hasn't surfaced from that committee. So it can't be used until 2025 at the earliest, four years after its intended first use. I know that Representative Dom is optimistic about it being approved this session, but as I said back in May, we really can't even depend on that. The legislature can easily bury it and make a mockery of our home rule. One quarter of a year ago, Rescore Citizens petitioned you all to also approach the Attorney General and ask for clarification on their approval of the charter and its intended implementation of ranked choice voting through a bylaw. Instead of following up on that simple idea, you instead asked the town's attorney to approach the Secretary of the Commonwealth with that question. I am told that their response is that they would not provide an opinion on the matter. So that was the dead end, also as I predicted. And what has happened since? So far as I know, nothing. The matter was discussed at your last meeting on July 17th, and the clear message was that there was nothing more you could do. In other words, you're ignoring our petition because that is something else you could do. It was suggested by one of you that there's no hurry now because of the short time until November. That's just procrastination. There was no reason this request to the Attorney General couldn't have been done back in May, and there's no reason to wait now. So please don't wash your hands of this matter. Don't wait. Please contact the Attorney General. The future of ranked choice voting in Amherst may depend on it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. That concludes public comment for the evening. Um, and we are going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, Anna, would you please put this consent agenda up on the screen? Yep, it's up. Thank you so much. Um, this, These up, Pieces were chosen because they were considered to be routine. Uh, if you want to remove an item after I do the first round, please let me know. And uh, the and then I will seek a, a second. If you remove an item, it does not require a second, and it will be discussed later in the evening. I also want to remind counselors that although something may appear on the consent agenda, when it if it's and it's passed you can still ask for more information when that agenda item comes up. So to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit, 6A resolution in support of an act expanding access to trails for people of all abilities. 8A withdrawal of measure proposed amendments to zoning bylaw article three, article four, article nine, and article 12 duplex triplex townhome converted dwellings. 8E, authorize the president to sign a letter in support of an act to modernize funding for community media programming. 11A, approval of July 17, 2023, regular meeting minutes. You, um, Mindy Joe, I see your hand up. Yes, I'd like to remove 8E, the authorization of the president to sign a letter in support of an act to modernize funding for community and media programming. Okay. Are there any other requests at this time? Oh, except for 8E, the motion is in front of you and I need a second. <laughs> I'm going to take Andy Steinberg on that one. That's fine. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. And you can take that down. I'm going to now call the vote. Uh, I did hear from Shalini. She'll be joining us later, but she is not here yet. Um, or at least I don't see her. Okay. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Uh, Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
Just give me one moment to just do some items. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are going to um, go on to, we have already done resolutions and proclamations. And Pat, I wanna just uh, um, apologize for not asking you to do this in advance, but are you able to read the last paragraph or two of the resolution? Uh, the, uh, the now there for us? Yes. Uh, yeah. I just wanna say that this was, uh, sponsored by the Disability Access Advisory Committee. And uh, out of, I just wanna give this one fact and then I'll go, out of the 4,000 miles of unpaved uh, accessible, um, or of unpaved hiking trails in Massachusetts, only 7.5 miles of those 4,000 miles are, um, are accessible. Um, all right, so now therefore be it resolved, that the town of Amherst calls on our state leaders and legislators to support S446 and H769, an act expanding access to trails for people of all abilities, presented by Senator Joanne Comerford and Representative Michelle Chicola, and currently assigned to the Joint Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Be it further resolved that the town of Amherst calls on the President of the Senate, Karen Spilka, Speaker of the House, Representative Robert Marion, members of the Massachusetts Joint Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, the Department of Conservation and Recreation and the Massachusetts Recreation Trail Advisory Board to support access to trails for people of all abilities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the Amherst Town Council shall cause a copy of the resolution to be sent to Governor Maura Healey, Senate President Karen Spilka, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Robert Marion, State Senator Joanne Comerford, State Representative Mindy Dom, and the members of the Joint Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, Department of Conservation and Recreation Commis Commissioner Brian Arrigo, and the members of the Massachusetts Recreation Trail Advisory Board. Uh, we need to stop uh, this incredible unequal treatment of residents. Thank you, Pat. Uh, there are no presentations and discussion tonight. We are going to go on to the action items. And under the action items, uh, the first is the withdrawal of measure proposed amendments for the zoning bylaw, Article 3, Article 4, Article 9, and Article 9, 12, duplex, triplex, townhouse, and converted dwellings. Uh, the sponsors have a memo in the packet, and I'd like to ask whether the sponsors at this time would like to speak to the memo. Mandy Jo or Pat? Okay. Um, Doug Marshall, who is chair of the plan. I feel like she was speaking. No, no, I just was gonna say that I feel comfortable that the memo states what we need to state. And if Mandy would like to add something, I'd support that. Thank you, Pat. Mandy the Jones? Memo, the memo speaks for itself. Thank you. Um, and uh, Doug Marshall, who is chair of the planning board has joined us. Doug, would you like to make any comments at this time? Uh, no, I do not. Um, you know, we have the recommendation memo that we made to town council and I think that speaks for itself. There were, uh, wide variety of opinions about the measure. Thank you. Okay. And I just want to recognize that Chris Brestrup is here with us tonight, uh, but is not going to comment at this point. Are there any comments from counselors at this time on this issue? Pam Rooney. Yeah, I didn't know if you were going to call on any of the reports from any of the other committees that may have heard this discussion and and um, and had any votes since you called on the planning planning board uh, were you were you ready to get a summary of any other uh, report GOL would be the other uh, I'm sorry not GOL um, CRC uh, would be the other 
report. And if you would like to comment, please do. Okay. Um, we had we had a good six months, I think, of discussion about this proposal. Um, we heard also as CRC members from the public. We heard from uh, the ZBA, and we also um, got the results of the planning board and the planning department input uh, on the proposal. Uh, I would, I think, I would capture the the essence of the feedback that was received from uh, outside of the CRC is that there was a strong sense that our existing zoning is not the reason that we, it's not the deterrent um, to affordable housing in Amherst. Uh, the ZBA was quite clear in, in that their process they felt was very clear and inclusive and that input from the public was in fact often res uh, resulted in better a better product. The planning board voted unanimously to not adopt the proposal, and uh, that that I think sort of summarizes uh, what's in the CRC report as well. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other committees that have the reports on this at this time? I don't believe so. But Dorothy Pam, you have your hand up. Right. I'm just uh, want to comment that this is a very complicated problem, and that the uh, challenge that we're facing now is that the economics of building uh, mean that affordable housing seems to, at least in in our town, only to be able to be built if it is subsidized. And so, one of the things that we have to think about is how can we get more subsidies? Uh, the federal government used to be very involved in this, um, but we need to get the state government. Uh, to do more, not just private entities, because we do need to have more affordable housing. Um, solutions which could work in many towns, increasing quantity of housing. Um, in a college town, many, many articles and research have shown in a college town, they don't work. And we are a college town. So we have to come up with some new ways, uh, not just increasing quantity of housing, because uh, that will be unaffordable housing that will not be in the reach of families, the families that we do want to keep here for full-time members. So uh, I uh, uh, certainly agree with the aims of the proposal, but I uh, am very aware of the fact that it's very complex to come up with a solution that will work in our town under this economy and our being a college town. So we need to come up with some new ways, but thank you. Are there any other counselors who would like to comment at this time? Seeing none, then we're going to move on to the proposed streetlight policy. Uh, I'm going to first ask for a sponsor update from Councillors Haneke and Devlin Guthier. And uh, then if TSO or GOL would like to comment, although the version that you see in your packet now has been revised since those committees have reviewed. Okay. So, Ned Joe or uh, Anna? I think Mandy's ready to. Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to start with a history of the proposal. Um, this was brought to the council about a year ago and referred to TSO. And if the council remembers, a year ago when we presented this proposal, it had two parts. We titled or re referenced one part as um, you know, performance specifications and another part as location specifications, where placements would be. We referenced those placement specifications by creating lighting zones, lighting zones that were separated both by how um, pedestrian volume and street use, whether they were residential or collector or, or arterial, um, and also location in town. So within each lighting zone of low, medium, or high light, um, we had separated even farther for things like, were they a residential street that had a lot of pedestrian traffic or not? Were they a collector street or an arterial street? When we got to TSO, the very comments we received on that portion of it, the locational standards portion, were that it needed more thought, time, discussion, and research. 
regarding which roads were low, medium, and high pedestrian traffic, when we would measure that traffic, what areas should be low light, medium light zones, and high light zones. TAC wanted more discussion. TSO said it needed more outreach. We were asked to remove the locational standards. Now, you may be wondering why I'm talking about this, because we did remove it, and it's not part of this proposal. Yet now, when we look at our proposal and the comments we hear now, many, many of those comments relate exactly to what was removed from this proposal. How much, how many streetlights should be on any one street because of how it is used, the locational standards. Now, Ms. Vogel's proposal may not reference it by lighting zone, but that's basically what it is. And so I just wanted to remind the council that that part was removed for particular reasons and was never thought to be abandoned. We always called it part two, a part that needed more discussion, more research, more thought, and that if we could do the performance standards, we could then move on to the other part. So what we're facing right now is not a change in where the locations are now. We can agree or disagree on what we think the location of a light should be. We have lights in town. Those lights are not safe. As you heard some of the commenters, they have over, they are glare heavy. They create a lot of glare, which is unsafe. They over light um, and they have the wrong color temperature. They are a color temperature that has seen higher rates of colorectal and breast cancer and other cancers in neighborhoods that have been early adopters of such lighting. Um, that's what we're trying to fix today and with this proposal is correct the glare, correct the color temperature, correct the over lighting of the illuminance levels or well it's not even the illuminance levels because that's actually not in our proposal the over lighting is lighting of the private properties that are next to the public way our our proposal proposes lighting the public way adequately um we i i absolutely agree that next steps are those lighting zones are we is is north pleasant street underlit because it doesn't have enough light poles we should have that discussion because our time, you know, our town has changed, but that's not what this policy right now proposes um, because we removed those at the request of the committee. We need a discussion about safety for roads and transportation mode shift, but that discussion isn't just about lighting. That's about designing streets to slow traffic. It's about building complete streets. It's about safety education of bicyclists. It's about other passive safety improvements that can be done. None of that belongs in a street light policy. The design of a street for complete streets is not a street light policy. It's a different type of policy. So that was basically, at least briefly, what I wanted to say. If there's other questions, I can certainly add, answer some other questions, but I'd pass it off to Anna if she wants to add anything. Anna. No, thank you. I think Mandy, Mandy covered it really. We've been I'm gosh, I think as someone has pointed out working on this for a year now, which is exciting. Um, and you know, I feel like we should get little cupcakes from our newest cupcake store in town. Uh, but I, I think, you know, we've really been seeking and appreciating the input that folks have. And I think as with any policy, this is a step in the the direction. Like Mandy said, there are there are more steps we can and should take. This is a step. Um, and it moves us in a direction that is safe. Um, and so, you know, I think we, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the folks who have given input that has pushed us further um, and that has shaped this policy. I think if you look at the many, many iterations that Mandy and I have both presented to this council, but also have saved on our computers that we've been working on over time, you'll see that the, the amount that we have taken into consideration uh, and that we've changed is significant. And so I do want to thank the folks who have who have provided expertise, input, and their own thoughts and opinions um, on on this proposal as well. Um, I'm now open for councilor comments. I am going to use the clock on the comments, and we're going to start with Dorothy Pam. Um, I do remember the conversation in TSO, in which we uh, agreed that um, shielding light downward uh, and uh, color of light and those things um, that did not seem to impede safety 
but were good for uh, the natural world uh, did not seem to cause any problems. But I have a question. Um, there's an, a, 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 it has been brought up that there's a difference between, and I don't know if I'm talking lumens or what I'm talking, but 2,700 versus 3,000. And I believe 2,700 is the number that you felt was better for the natural world, but 3,000 was the number that safety at pedestrian safety ad, uh, advocates uh, liked. I'm so I'm just wondering if there's some clarification on that because um, that that presents a problem. Mandy, Joe, or Andy, um, or Anna. I'm sorry. Um, I can do my best. Uh, Pepperell has actually installed 2200 Kelvin streetlights, referred to as amber streetlights, and the police indicate that that actually produces better visibility, even though they are less bright than before. A lot of people think blue light is safer because it's clearer sometimes, or it's perceived as clearer, but it actually produces more glare um, and, and produces... Um, the, uh, more glare is the big one. So, so the goal with the 2200, um, that, that, well, we, we originally proposed 2200. We've moved it to 2700 because 2200 can be difficult to find. Um, as Guilford said, 2700 is much more standard. Um, I can't just, I, I can't really describe the huge difference between 2700 and 3000. They're both kind of uh, warm white. Uh, 3000 is obviously less warm. 4,000 is where we are now, somewhere between four and 6,000. And those are the Kelvins that have shown in research studies to increase rates of cancer at exposure at night, including in people who live in neighborhoods with 4,000 Kelvin lights. Um, breast cancer, colorectal cancers, other cancers. The uh, AMA has actually recommended all street lights be warm white at 3,000 Kelvin or lower. Pepperell's Policy, I believe, allows for up to 3,000 if 2,700 can't be found, but they've actually gone with, I believe, 2,200. Um, so there is a slight difference of opinion, but there is research out there and experience out there that shows that 2,700 and 2,200 produce provide just as much visibility and necessary visibility if you light properly that others do, but is much safer for the body. Uh, Andy? Yes, I'm going to make a motion, and after I make the motion, I will explain it. I'm moving under uh, Council Rule 7.1, Subpart 7, to postpone uh, the vote on this uh, motion until September 11 meeting, September 11, 2023 meeting. Okay, a motion's been made. I need a second. Second, DeAngelis. Okay. Andy, could you restate the, the motion again, please? The motion is pursuant to Rule 7.1, Subpart 7 of the Rules of Procedure to postpone the vote on this motion until September 11, 2023. Um, okay, the, uh, the motion's been made in a second. Would you like to? I'm could sorry. Could I just make a point of order? I, 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 more of a point of information. Could Andy give us what Rule 7.1 subset 7 reads um, so we don't 7. all have. 7.1 is motions. Um, when a measure main motion is under debate, the following motions are permitted, and subpart 7 is postponed to a certain time. And the reason I'm making the motion uh, is that uh, I told um, the Finance Committee and asked the Finance Committee only members only to respond to me because of open meeting law um, concerns with the, and with the simple question as to whether members of the committee would like to have the opportunity to um, consider the finance, whether there are financial implications to this motion. And uh, the uh, uh, res response was um, that there were two people who felt, felt very strongly that we should postpone to have that opportunity. 
for the Finance Committee to um, uh, make that inquiry. Um, and one member uh, responded saying that uh, he was essentially ambivalent, but willing uh, uh, to go to to go forward with the vote tonight. So I wanted to report that to you too. Uh, but I felt since there were two members who um, had a strong opinion that I would make the motion. The um, I think that there are um, questions about uh, the um, staff time and um, equipment purchase and capital um, that might be involved and uh, Guilford uh, mooring the superintendent of public works is available for the um, next finance committee meeting on August 22nd. And uh, we will still have the benefit of our current finance director's presence. And uh, so the uh, date of September 11 is just simply the next meeting after um, that meeting with time to provide a report of any discussion and consideration that takes place in the finance committee. Um, and uh, I, I know that there's at least one other member of the committee who is um, present and uh, in the meeting today with indicating wishing to speak. So I don't know if she wants to speak on that issue or not. But anyway, that's the motion and the reason for it. And uh, I think the last thing that I'm going to say in, 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 uh, just for a matter of disclosure, as a member of TSO, um, I supported um, the um, motion that's on the floor, the main motion that's on the floor tonight. Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded. And uh, I'd like the people who have raised their hands to, uh, if you will, kind of speak to the motion or any other issues that relate to this. Okay, Kathy? Point of order, Lynn. Can we run the clock? I, I forgot how yeah. you said. You Thank you. I, I I will do so. <laughs> Excuse me while I turn my head the other way to do deal with my other computer. Okay. So, Kathy. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I reserve the right to come back on. I'm going to speak just to the motion right now. Um, I was similarly going to make a motion to postpone, and I actually had picked a later date than Andy. I was going to push it off till October 2nd. I think we need a financial assessment. I think we also need uh, to look at whether we can get more balanced wording. Um, it's not so much, Mandy, on a, I need you to put every street back in, but I think there are places that it's overly prescriptive and technical to the point of micromanaging. And we need time to assess that rather than being told this study says this or that. I've been clicking as you spoke, and there is even controversy on some of them. And so I think the wording could be softer in the technical appendix. I don't have a problem for the most part with the beginning statements. So I think it would give us time to really have a substantive discussion, to get more public input, and to potentially look at you know, what exceptions and how the public would weigh into exceptions. So I, I think I'm going to stop there, but I wanted a longer period. I'm willing to support Andy's to September 11th. I have prepared about a five page memo and then I've marked up the PDF with questions on wording, some of which would be a GOL, but places where I specifically think we should soften the wording. So I want to speak to that secondly. I'm finished on why I think postponing makes total sense. I might also mention that rule eight point, I so rarely do this, I'm going to have to double look, eight point something or other, 8.4. Uh, eight, rule 8.4 says whenever there is a policy or a measure proposed that we do not vote on it until we have a thorough discussion on it. So we don't vote it on it till the next meeting. In this case, I think we need a financial review. So it wouldn't be the next meeting, but until the finance committee can meet, which as Andy has pointed out is August 22nd. Thank you. I just want to clarify, this actually is the council's second reading. There have, have, however, there have been 
uh, some serious revisions since that first okay. reading. Okay. I would say I would say what before us is so completely different when this is the first reading. So I would just argue with that. Um, it, as Mandy said, that they really went back and rewrote. Um, so it's the first time, certainly, that I've seen it since it was way back in a year ago. Thank you. Okay. I have a point of order, Lynn. Yes. So first, Shalini is here. You might want to recognize her. And second, could you clarify for me? I'm sorry for the delay. Is uh, who seconded the motion? Andy. Who no, said? I'm Pat. sorry. Pat. Pat, Pat second. second. Thank you. Motion. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And again, this is part of everyone being patient with our amateur uh, clerk of the council responsibilities. Um, I'm going to. Uh, uh, and Shalini. I'm, uh, yes, thank you. Shalini, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Welcome. And we will now note that we have all 13 counselors present. I also just want to mention there's about eight people in the Zoom audience. I'm sure there's many others on the T on watching on TV. Uh, Michelle, please go ahead. I do have a question for Mandy and Anna um, that was based on uh, the earlier presentation that they made, but I can hold hold that for now. Um, I would like to support Andy's motion. I um, I think that it's it's a good idea to have a, a financial review, um, but I had uh, also um, submitted a motion. Um, given the substantial revisions that have been made, um, and I, I understand that Rule 8.6 of our rules procedure does not define its expectations regarding a revised measure, um, I do believe a GOL review is appropriate um, before this would be voted on. So I know that GOL did look at it in its earliest version, and I believe declared it uh, clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, but there have been substantial revisions, and I think it would be appropriate for us to have it go back to GOL. Um, I also was in my motion asking for a substantive review so that some of this uh, valuable input that we've received um, could potentially be included um, in that review. So um, I do support Andy's uh, motion, um, but also think that we should find a way to get it to GOL um, for one more review before it's voted on. Thank you. Let me continue with the hands that are up, and then we'll see if there's going to be a, re a revision to the motion. Uh, Anika. Uh, thank you. So I um, I want to start as a member and chair of TSO again to thank the sponsors. I know that there has been so much work that has gone into this and numerous attempts to gather uh, concerns and feedback um, from counselors, but this is a, this is packed and I recognize that as well. Uh, and I also just wanted to you know, both, both confirm and appreciate the separation of that, that, that this is in two parts. Um, as many know from the reports, um, the consensus coming from TSO was in regards to the need to lessen uh, light pollution. Um, and I think everyone was on the same page as that, where the differs were, were um, safety and greatly around um, walkability. And I know sometimes walkability seems to be pieced. You know, there are many um, different elements that are being brought up for safety concerns, but I would just, I think this, this if with this pause, it does give us a, a chance to really look at walkability in its entirety and holistically and looking at that, there is no separation between vulnerable populations, between those who use, like myself, depend on public transportation and always have, as opposed to those making choices um, to bike or to walk for leisure purposes. Um, and you know, whether it's disability or you know, our, our senior population for true walkability score, scores, in particularly within town lifestyle, they're all included in that whole. So I do appreciate the, um, the, the sponsors for separating the two. Um, and this could give time for people to really digest because it seems like those concerns are coming um, as, as pieced as opposed to uh, the whole 
Um, you know, I, I 100% appreciate the night sky and us being able to see it, um, look, you know, grew up with it, missed it, looked forward to seeing it when I decided to move back home. Um, but one of the, you know, my other major reasons that was a pro for me was, you know, transportation, seeing where we're going. Um, and, and also, I think this allows for us to really include more of populations that are being spoken for, um, especially in regards to where we have more dense apartment complexes, which are historically used. There are bus stops where there's quite a long walk to get to either one's building or, or, uh, or unit. Uh, so those were just my concerns at, and just comments at this point, along with thank you to the sponsors. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, yes, I um, I was totally um, support delaying a decision till a later date, and very much appreciate you know think it should go to finance. So I would be I was I've always been concerned that if we don't have the budget in place to fully implement the recommendations, and we do some and not others, we could be making some streets darker without being able to replace them lights with what um, the sponsors are recommending would, would we be better served by. So I think we have to know if we can kind of holistically implement um, the policy as proposed. And I don't know that we can do that by September 11th. I, I should say we could probably get the finance committee recommendation, but I wouldn't, I think we need more time to address and allay the concerns that the pedestrian and um, and traffic safety experts in E. Vogel and Tracy Zafian and perhaps others, I wouldn't be able to support it as long as, you know, those experts in our community in pedestrian, cyclists, and traffic safety have real concerns. I'm not an expert, so I have to kind of rely on the advice of experts. And I understand that James Lowenthal, as the dark skies expert, is feels comfortable with the policy, but I wouldn't be able to support it until, frankly, Tracy Zafian and E. Vogel felt comfortable with it. And I do get concerned, of course, we have to, you know, educate, um, do safety education for cyclists and pedestrians, but I live on a major connector street to the university. And, you know, it's new residents in, you know, students are new residents every year. So it's, we don't have a lot of time to educate people before I see cyclists who probably don't know or don't heed what they do know. Bicycling, um, you know, down Lincoln Avenue, Sunset Avenue, Amity um, at night without lights on the bikes in dark jackets. And it's quite terrifying because as a driver, you don't see them until you are very close. And even though these are major, these are busy streets, major connector streets to the university, lots of pedestrian traffic um, late at night, the streets are not well lit. And, you know, often students, you know, carry, um, they use the flashlights on their phones, but I would be very concerned about relying on just um, safety education of cyclists and pedestrians. I would want to be comfortable that, again, our traffic and safety experts um, felt comfortable with the proposal before um, voting to adopt it. Thank you. Pam Rooney. Thank you. I would um, also support Kathy's suggestion that it happen at a, at a later date if Andy wanted to restate his motion or, or amend it to October 2nd. I think the a lot of work has gone into it and obviously a lot of work has gone into rewriting portions given feedback, which is a really good thing. Um, but I but I would like to know that there has been an opportunity for TAC, for instance, to actually formally sit and review it with the sponsors. Um, one of the concerns is that um, the revisions have happened after after some of the, the more public vetting uh, and input. So it needs to have a, a pass through again to confirm that the changes in fact are in the right direction and that are appropriate. So I would I would definitely support an October 2 um, reprise for, uh, for this. Pat? 
I also support postponement for many of the reasons that have been stated, but I uh, want to bounce back to Councillor Miller's suggestion that there be a substantive review in GOL. I, I'm not understanding why a committee that deals with clarity, consistency, and actionability is being asked to look at this substantively. Um, so I would like clarification either from the president or um, before that happens, we're getting more and more uh, requests to look at things substantively. And uh, I'm not sure that that's appropriate for the way the charge of the committee is written. Uh, and it might, might make more sense for this to go back uh, to TSO for a substantive review of changes. Um, thank you. Uh, Pat, let me go on and get the other three comments that we have, and then we'll see whether or not perhaps we're going to amend the motion. Um, Dorothy. Um, I would like to make a suggestion that since there's a good possibility that there will be some changes made in our lighting policy, that instead of waiting for that to happen and then to talk about a public education program, that we get a head start on it, which would include um, maybe through the bid, the chamber, uh, I, I don't know, a major, major movement on reflective uh, hats and jackets or patches. Uh, I mean, people are not, I am shocked as I, as I drive. I see people dressed all in black, walking in the dark, okay? Again and again and again. And I do not want to hit somebody. I really, really don't. So uh, I would suggest that while this is in the process of being refined and developed in a way where we can all accept it and be happy about it, that we start some of this education program now with um, giveaway projects and with promotions and all kinds of things, because we still have dangerous danger on our streets. We still have pedestrians who are not seen. We still have bike riders who are not seen. And we've had deaths. And uh, we're a college town. We will always be getting new students every year. And each, each new batch has to be educated in and brought into our ways. Um, we should have a culture that is much stronger than it is now of, of uh, lighting, individual lighting, so that when we have this change, we're in a better position for it. That is my suggestion. Thank you. Andy, uh, I'm gonna go to you, Michelle, and then Mandy Joe. Okay. Um, just very quickly, uh, under motion, the motion that I made, somebody, of course, can come in and make a and move to amend the motion to change the date that I specified. Uh, I explained that I did it so that it would be sufficiently after the finance committee meeting, but I was trying to honor the um, two co-sponsors by not um, proposing a date that was longer than necessary for the reason that I was stating. So, um, no, I totally understand, though, if somebody else makes a motion to amend motion on the floor, why they are doing it. Okay. Um, Michelle? Pat, I just wanted to respond. I really appreciate that, especially as a former chair of the, of the GOL committee. I, I totally agree. Um, my major concern was that the, the substantial revisions that have been made hadn't gone through GOL. Um, yeah, and, I, and, and knowing that some of these other checks and balances and sort of inputs are going to happen, hopefully, um, if that gets voted, um, I think the, subs the substantive review was just uh, sort of my voice around that aspect of things. So that's, thank you. Mandy Jo. I guess as a sponsor or co-sponsor, I'm seeking some clarity from the council. We're talking a lot about changes and all, but the changes that appear to be being requested from a number of people, especially when you talk about going back to TAC and getting changes in conformity with uh, Ms. Vogel's and Ms. Safian's, um, Safian's um, requests regarding the amount of light on a street and the continuity of light on a street. And I'm just going to give North Pleasant Street as an example, which right now may not have enough street lights, but right now complies with our current policy. 
which we were told basically not to propose changes to in terms of where lights go. And so I guess the clarification I'm asking for is, is the council now wanting essentially that lighting zone and lighting placement standards that we were, were told to remove so that we could get the specifications and performance standards in? And if so, does it want us to repropose those? <laughs> Um, because, you know, as TSO said very early on, and as the sponsors admitted very early on, such a proposal, even though we made a proposal, would require extensive, extensive outreach, research, and um, discussion amongst many different committees. And so I guess I need clarification. Are, is this, does this council want that in this policy before we vote? Because if so, a month and even two months is not enough. And it really does need a referral back to committees to do that and to do that outreach. Um, but if, there, if, if the council's saying, no, let's tweak around the edges and potentially come back with two motions, one motion to adopt the proposal, the policy, and another motion to create or send a referral back to a committee to do the work for something else, that can be done in a month or two. So I, I guess as a co-sponsor, I am I need clarity as to what this council wants. Uh, uh, Mandy Jo, your question is absolutely appropriate. Uh, and one of the things that I've been observing is that there seems to be a consensus, we haven't voted, but a consensus that needs to go to finance. But then there's this other question about larger issues. And so um, I, um, you made one suggestion and that is that we try to get this present uh, policy to the point that it covers the general policy for street lighting and that there might be a subsequent motion that says, please um, start working on lighting districts or whatever you want to call them, okay? For lack of a more precise term. Uh, Kathy? Thanks, Lynn. Um, please start the clock at three minutes. But anyway, um, I, you know, Mandy, you're asking whether there are some tweaks, um, minor changes. And I, I made an effort in the second week of July to send you a markup that tried to identify a few places, but I'll give an example. And this is why I think we need just a little bit longer time, maybe not bring in every safety and street. Um, appendix 2.2. A, and as I said, the appendix is my concern. It's it, I've never seen this prescriptive a policy appendix before. It's, it's micromanaging, um, maybe because you need these, but this is what it says. A maximum illumination level at the public right-of-way line abutting residential or sensitive uses, except in the municipal parking district and village centers, shall not exceed 0 0.01 foot candle as measured at grade in either the horizontal or vertical planes. I would like to know whether the 13 of us understand what that means, how many people in our residential world. And I think when I looked at the Northampton policy, the 0.01 foot candle varied depending on whether it was Montague Road, that's my road, no sidewalks, 45 mile an hour and people walk on it, 0.01, because the concern is about trespass, not about illumination. And trespass is a very negative term, you know? So, so like 0.01, so I don't know how many of our current lights don't comply with 0.01 and how many would require, we're not talking about a downward shield just, we're talking about a downward shield and the extent, and Eve's thing drew us diagrams that illustrated the, the light scope. So I think it's these places where it says shall, it doesn't say might want to consider or could they vary. It's, it's places like this that I feel like we have directly said, this is what must be done, um, including the lumens, the AMA, 2016 AMA put something out on LED lights. They've since said maybe this and maybe that. These are, you know, what level and where. So I think 
it's the technical appendix that needs to be reviewed. And there is some wording that GOL could probably clean up where sentences are really complex and have four things in them. Um, so that's why I think it might be longer than September 11th, because if it went to GOL, even for clarity, I'm not sure they could meet and give us a markup that finance could meet and raise any concerns. And it's not quite clear to me how a member of the public whose light is about to change weighs in. Northampton has a really nice three sets of civic forms. One is moderator light, one is removal light, and one is... So they're just places where I think it's tweaks. It's not revised the whole policy, but it would take time. And I am submitting a written comment tonight to the thing with a markup, because I sent one to the sponsors, but I haven't sent it to anyone else. Thank you. And we will post that as soon as we are able to post. Uh, Paul will work with whomever has to do that. Pam Rooney? Yeah, I was I was going to comment uh, on Mandy's uh, question to the to the council and I think my reaction to put, putting it out a little further is that because there has been so much adaptation of input there's been a lot of change made to the document I think I think the robust conversations and and evaluations occurred you know on version two instead of on version 10 and I would really like I would really like them to have a thorough, solid conversation on version whatever it is now 10 i'll call it um and that's that's why i'm asking to have it put off i it's, it's a lot like our other policies that we've been working on we keep tweaking as it goes and nobody but the writers really know now what's in it and i'd like i'd like for instance tax to be able to see it in its entirety and be able to weigh in on that rather than on an earlier version thank you Michelle? Um, I'm just wondering if we're veering from, we have a motion on the table. Right. Um, right. So, and also um, I'm wondering, we're talking about all of these various suggestions to tweak language, um, you know, to have TAC look at it, but we, I think we need to get some clarity on where are we sending this and <laughs> for what, <laughs> basically. Um, and I think that Mandy's question on, on clarifying that is, is important. So I don't know if we have that conversation and then deal with this motion, but we do have this motion on the table. Thank you. Um, so let me, Shalini. Go ahead. Oh, Lynn, if you want to clarify something. Well, I'm trying to uh, answer, get to and get to a point where we either vote this motion or we amend this motion. And I'm hearing a couple different options. One is that we lengthen the time and we suggest and that the motion include other committee reviews. But it also, I, I want to be totally respectful of the sponsors and of the many other people who have weighed in and wonder if the sponsors have additional things they would want to work on before we do those reviews. Or, or have you basically said, we're done? That's a question to Mandy, Joe, and Anna. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> I think that maybe maybe there's a little bit, Mandy, and I, I guess Mandy, I, I I'll defer to you. But I mean, I think we've we've I I know that everything that people want isn't necessarily in here, but we have truly fine tooth combed this thing, and so I think that um, Mandy, do you have any strong feelings? I mean, we we obviously believe it's complete and ready for a vote yet. If it goes back to committee, it will inevitably face changes and we will probably get together and review again with all of the additional comments. Uh, you know, we just received more comments today with markups and, you know, we we have looked at them. Kathy will look at yours again. We looked at yours the last time, you know, and so I can't say it won't change, you know, because we do take into consideration everything we've heard. It's it's why I asked my question, what would you be looking for from us so that we know? So it seems okay. to me, I'm sorry, Shalini, 
Was that yeah. you? Yeah, can I weigh in at this point? Sure. Okay, so I'm seeing it's two different, in addition to what everyone has said, and thanks to everyone who's worked so hard, uh, I think what I'm seeing is that two different things. One is like the financial aspect that definitely needs consideration and agree with that. But I think overall, uh, it's helpful to get the clarification that we're not discussing location and all of that. We're just talking about the lighting specifications. My concern is really about one specific aspect, which is will the new lighting uh, recommendation, especially in certain areas, as we are hearing that the sh additional shielding and the yellow lighting, is that going to reduce the safety? And that's my understanding from the articles we're reading, reading is that it's going to reduce the safety in certain neighborhoods, not like other, generally it's going to improve, there's less glare, which is more safety inducing and all of that. But in North Amherst, can the sponsors or the town confirm that with the additional shielding and the yellowing of the light and the reducing of the Kelvin or whatever, is it going to reduce the safety for pedestrians and bikers? And if it does decrease the safety, then we do need to go back and do we need to specify the, uh, the strategies according to the zones, and again, not adding more or less, but just in terms of the lighting, the how yellow and what the Kelvins are going to be, does, does the existing proposal need to add that additional level of specificity? My, and my apologies for not starting the clock, but that's, that's the question at hand. Uh, Anika, please go ahead. I just wanted to add uh, quickly at this point, I think that we have kind of landed on the, there is an extension here, but my question is also just food for thought and going forward in process that, you know, we have, we do have sponsors who are spending a lot of time on proposals and where that does not mean that anyone should have to feel rushed, but where is that point where we vote? whether you vote for or against, just where where is that point? And then I guess just clarity that, you know, if we're if we, you know, if this is going back to committee and whichever one that was, I mean, we might not know what uh, what comes from that. And that could also that time could be guided by what the opinions of said committees are. So um, I just think, you know, counting that in and just maybe for uh, further uh, discussion just in terms of that that process how how does that work so we can be clear so we can take into account residents concern but that we are most efficiently and effectively using our utilizing our time uh shalini you have your hand up yes I do. I do have a, another comment with respect to process. And as a member of the town services and outreach committee, I take full responsibility as being a member of that committee. And uh, I feel that in terms of process, we could improve, and this is for all future processes too, um, in terms of there has not been a clear process for how we are incorporating the feedback. I know the sponsors have been speaking with uh, TAC and individual residents, but it doesn't feel clear to me, at least the committee member, uh, that what is the process where we are officially soliciting the, the written uh, feedback from TAC and other committees, for that matter, DAC, for example. And once the changes are made by the sponsors, which I know they have been incorporating, have you been sending it back to these committees to incorporate their recommendations. Do they agree or disagree? Or So there hasn't been, in my mind at least, or if it's been happening, it's happening behind the scenes, so I don't know. But I think there needs a little more clarity and that's some of the frustration I've been hearing from residents and other people as well. And uh, so that is one area we could have a little more improvement if it comes back to TSO is that we sit with the TAC and officially uh, and invite Eve as well as a past member of um, PAC, but also knowledgeable on this issue to be part of this conversation that how do we separate this out as two separate proposals? One is a location, which is the more comprehensive work we need to do. But right now to just refine this current proposal 
in terms of what Kathy was highlighting and what was sent to us by Eve today, there's certain tweaks and all that can be done and how to make sure that we're not, we're only improving upon and not decreasing the safety in certain neighborhoods. So that would be my recommendation. Michelle. Uh, I was just going to attempt to amend the current motion um, on the floor, but I'm, I'm also hearing what Charlene is saying. Um, I, I, my amendments were going to be to change the date to October 2nd, um, as well as to uh, it's already being referred in this um, in, in this motion to finance. So I would also ask that it be referred to GOL um, just for clarity, consistency. Um, and actionability prior to a vote. And then I'm wondering if perhaps we could have a check-in at council in one of the September meetings, um, if there is, if time allows for that, to uh, have any further discussion about uh, changes that the sponsors may have made in consultation with the various stakeholders um, and folks who are providing input. Um, so it's it's so that we're sort of getting a, a sense of of what's happening as they're moving through that process and, and holding the work um, on behalf of the council. Um, so the amendments again would be to change the date to October 2nd to add a GOL review for clarity, consistency and actionability. Um, and then sort of the other pieces that I described aren't necessarily uh, in the motion, but uh, just to ask the town council president if we could have um, a, a check in on this matter in September. Um, okay, I uh, thank you, Michelle. Let's let let me see if I can bring this to some sense of closure. It does seem to me that the sponsor- Excuse me, Lynn. Yes. Can I just restate the motion, see if there's a second for that motion, for the amendment, which uh, is to- Yes. Is to okay. change the date from September 11th to October 2nd, 2023. And in addition to refer it to the GOL committee and the finance committee, right? The, that is correct, okay. And then second, how, in addition to that, okay, is there a second? Change seconds. Okay. Mandy Jo, you have your hand raised. I was just going to ask who was second. That's, thank you. Okay. So in addition to that, however, there may be some additional changes that come out of documents that have been sent to us in the last 48 hours or going to be posted or whatever the case. Um, at the end, what I'm hearing from one counselor is the concept that we bring back any further changes and we have a substantive discussion about those kinds of changes at one of our September meetings. We only have two. Uh, we have a meeting on September 11th and September 18th. Um, and, you know, we have to do what we have to do. So uh, I'm perfectly open to that. If we start having significant substantive changes and they need to be discussed in a more public forum, which they should be, then it actually should go to another committee and that committee unfortunately would be TSO. I don't mean that unfortunately because I don't uh, respect the committee. I'm just saying they've already spent a lot of time on this. So if we come back with substantive review of this in September, I'll try to do it for the 11th, there may be a further referral back to TSO uh, to make sure that input has been done and it's been done in a public way. Okay. So the motion that is now on the floor, Paul, please read it. Uh, to amend the main motion, which is Andy's motion, to change the date from September 11th, 2023 to October 2nd, 2023, and to add that the, the um, the measure would be sent to GOL and Finance Committee. So we can do this in one of two ways, um, I believe, unless somebody wants to correct me. We can ask the original person who made the motion whether they will accept these as friendly amendments. Paul, can't do I, I, that. Way? No, you actually have a motion on the floor right now. Okay, you have to All act right. on it. So we will act on the motion to amend. The motion to amend extends the date and adds GOL to the review process. Are there any questions? Shalini. Just a clarification with the GOL, then 
of deliberation include bringing in the other stakeholders? No. Uh, comments? No. That's not the role so, of GO. Right. That would be substantive. And so I, I would like to see that happen. So does that mean we we vote on this because this needs to happen also but then should we have a separate motion to bring it to tso for that if there's going to be a public discussion with individuals and or other committees then it needs to be referred mm -hmm. to the committee and not gol and that committee would be right. TSO. right so should i make that motion then separate so, to this one or will this be amended further um so in this situation, you could make a mo you can amend the amendment, mm -hmm. or you can ask if it's a friendly amendment. If the maker of the motion mm -hmm. would accept the to add in addition mm -hmm. GOL and finance committee, you would ask. I think you're saying to add TSO mm -hmm. to that list. Right. Yes, please. Can Andy? Would you consider the that? That would be that would be Michelle's uh, motion. Oh, sorry. Okay. Michelle. Yeah, Michelle. <laughs> Um, Shalini, I really, I do, I appreciate um, the intention behind the request. I, I, I know. No. I, okay, that's fine. Um, I can do it as a separate motion then. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have the original motion. We have an amendment to the original motion, and so we can vote on the amendment and then come back to see whether it's going to be amended yet again. Okay. Correct. Correct. The original amend amendment to the motion is that it would be reviewed by both GOL and finance, and the date would be extended to October 2nd. Okay. That is the amendment to the original motion. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, I'm going to start with Shalini Belmilm. Yeah. Patty Angelis. Hi. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yeah. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Okay. So that was the vote on the amendment to the main motion. We're now back to the main motion, unless somebody wants to make an additional amendment. Shalini. So is this where I make the amendment yes. to please send it back to TSO to incorporate the, or incorporate or do um, in, Incorporate and consult with TAC and other state and in, incorporate other residents. Ah, how do I say that? So, what you want to do is you want to amend the motion so that it goes to PSO uh -huh. and it for them to consult with so, individuals and TAC. TAC and TAC, yes. Okay. Are you extending the date? Um, not further than the October one that's already been. October 2nd. Okay. Anika? Is, it, uh, I'm sorry. Is there a second? Second. Second, Rooney. Second. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Pam Rooney was the second. Anika, you have your hand up. Or Shalini, before I before I go to Anika, Shalini, did you want to speak any further to the motion, or basically you've already said what you needed to say? Um, I think I've already said. Um, yeah, I think I've said. And if I hear that people have questions, I'm happy to elaborate more. Okay. Anika, yes, I just have a question for uh, clarity. So, and this is uh, for both Shalini and Lynn. So. Um, I thought that I was an act and that I understood that that um, Michelle had asked for a, a review that we would have prior to having any GOL recommendation. 
And there would be a chance there that this would be recommended back to TSO. So with this, we would have both TSO looking again and GOL. So we would have both committees having a review going again and the, and the sponsors working with both committees at the same time. That is correct. This uh, the, Shalini's motion of, to amend sends it to TSO and asks specifically that they work with individuals that have provided input as well as uh, TAC on any further substantive changes to the bylaw. I mean, to the uh, policy. So it does do that. Michelle? It, just building on um, what Aniko was asking, I um, would like to ask somebody from TSO how how much has this is how has this been in T TSO for for quite a, a long time, right? And it's been discussed in TSO m multiple times, I, I assume. Um, and so I'm just wondering, um, maybe uh, to ask the chair, Anika of TSO, what or anyone, what if it went back to TSO might be able to happen that hasn't already happened. Um, or could that happen through a sort of a process of working with the sponsors um, and then bringing it back to the full council in September to review? I Either one of those sounds like a, a good possible option, but without knowing what TSO has already done and what they have to do, I'm just curious how, how that lands. Anika? Uh, yes, so thank you for that. So yes, it has gone, it has been in TSO for, you know, quite some time, but then, you know, as to everyone's point that there, there have been revisions and then, you know, different opinions after, after those revisions and still, you know, and then referred on to council with those, with the concerns that were left with, with TSO um, to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, we have met um, Trace, Tracy Daffin, who um, I really appreciate her email today, um, especially her, her third bullet point for everyone who was able to read that. Uh, but she is an honorary member, I would say, of, of TSO. Uh, so she's she's with us all the time, who we uh, have who we have not engaged with directly through TSO, um, as Dorothy's point has been maybe the bid or uh, the community outside of just the few who are mentioned, like those who actually do rely on, on uh, public transportation outside of leisure or who make the choice to. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, there are aspects of community that who we haven't dealt with. How, however, I would also like to extend the question to um, the, the sponsor just in terms of capacity issues, because if, if we are doing this, this is, you know, uh, we're, we are definitely expanded. This is a, a new ball game, which I mean, that that is fine. However, um, is there a way that we, I think it would be important that if this is what we do, that we streamline it so we're very clear on you know what those responsibilities are and what the goals so we can put realistic you know timelines on those and so we're not handing over a um, hundred recommendations on to the sponsors who are you know trying to I, th I think balance this as best that they can um thank you Mika. I, I would like to also mention that once uh, once people are beginning to consult with individuals, what you what we as a council really are committed to is maximum transparency. And the way that maximum transparency happens is that it happens in committee meetings. So uh, I'm actually um, feel that if we're if there is going to be a substantive conversation with uh, TAC again or TAC as a body, and or a substantive conversation in which others who have weighed in or might still want to weigh in, then it should happen in a committee, and the appropriate committee in this case would be TSO. 
because it's, it's certainly not GOL and it's certainly not finance. Um, Shalini, you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to answer Michelle's question. And what, as a member of TSO, and as I said earlier, I take full responsibility in terms of the process, we have not yet defined very clearly how we are uh, inviting, officially inviting feedback from TAC, which we have been, we got some, but we got an email and then we got a lot of personal emails from different members, present and past from TAC, but if none of it was officially documented or at in a committee meeting, as Lynn just said. So what I'm proposing by bringing it back to TSO is that, especially given the nuances that have been brought forward, that we uh, officially as TSO send the latest format for uh, the document to TAC and invite TAC yeah. along with Eve or anyone else for that matter to our TSO meeting to go over what, um, what their proposals are and changes they'd like to make. And again, what I'm hearing as a council, we are separating, there is a comprehensive change that needs to happen. And that is not what I'm proposing at this point. I'm just going with, what I just want to ensure is that with the existing changes, to the lighting fixtures and the type of lighting that we are not reducing the safety in any particular neighborhood. And my understanding is overall, it's not going to do that, but there are certain neighborhoods that if we don't incorporate and look at it carefully, we might be reducing the safety of pedestrians and bikers. So this TSO meeting would be very specifically looking at what is the current proposal and how to make sure that it's not going to reduce the safety by incorporating TAC and Eve and any other members' feedback. Ideally, I would say that this should happen before GOL looks because it seems to me that GOL will, will have to look at it twice, which is what I was trying to do is say that TSO does this and then GOL looks at it, but finance can look at it in the back. Uh, Shalini, again, I'm sorry I didn't run the clock. Um, this is... Uh, let me start. Uh, I I would agree with you. GOL has to look at it after TAC is after TSO is finished, and finance is finished. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. So it's my understanding TAC meets once a month. I don't know when. Um, and I guess what I don't un, you know. I'm kind of speaking as chair of CRC that's not really involved in this committee, this this discussion, but has done a lot of extensive public outreach. Um, we we have done the specific comments from people and in incorporating them and their views into meetings by having public listening sessions. And I guess I don't know if that's what's being requested here or whether um, you know, with with specific things like that, with listening sessions, or whether what's being requested is that TSO hold a meeting and then specifically invite just certain members of the public to essentially be panelists at that meeting, but not other members of the public, um, or just is it a joint meeting with TAC because that might take even longer to schedule? I'm worried about timeline here um, and and the complicatedness of it because it sounds like it's getting more and more complicated what's being requested by this amendment um, in terms of timing, not that it's not valuable, but it, it I don't know whether it can all be completed by October 2nd, if it really is joint meetings or public listening sessions with the outreach that goes along with that and the planning that goes along with that, or whether it's not that and something else that I'm just not quite understanding at this time. Mindy Jo, one of the reasons I asked um, about the deadline is because I totally feel that uh, October 2nd is more than ambitious, in fact, impossible. And what you've just described, it, which is something you have done a lot of in CRC um, and is described in our rules of procedure, various options for having meetings in which there's panelists and joint meetings and people who speak. So if this goes back to TSO, I would encourage TSO to look at some of those 
uh, public options for input. Uh, and, um, and that could include, you know, a joint meeting with TAC, but then also having a dialogue with the public. Uh, I mean, any number of options could happen. Uh, let me just go back. There is a motion to amend the motion that's on the table. The motion that is on the table now includes CRC. I mean, so, I'm sorry, geez, let me start. It includes a review by finance and a review by GOL. And it has it all happening by October 2nd. And whether the person who made the motion to add TSO to this has certain goals in mind, you can't just narrow what people are gonna come and talk about, whether it's safety or not. Um, so my question now goes back to, is October 2nd realistic? I personally do not believe it is. Uh, it seems to me like we're looking more like a November or even a December. Michelle? I, I, oh, uh, Anna, actually. Um, um, please go uh, ahead, Anna. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to say, I'd rather not have to come back and ask for an extension or feel rushed. So I think that if that's, um, if that's what we need in, toward, in terms of that, I also know, you know, I, I know we haven't figured out the, the full TSO calendar, but I think that there's going to need to be timing in advance if we are going to do some sort of public listening session. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I, I think October 2nd may be ambitious, even though it feels far in the future. So your options for November are November 6th, which I think we may need to look at, relook at anyway, because of the election, uh, and November 20th. Um, if you said we need to look at the, relook at the 6th, it would be safer to put it on the 20th, but either of those would be fine, I think. Okay, let's, I'm going to suggest the 20th as a way of moving us on. Um, Michelle? I, I just, you know, I was I'm thinking about this um, similarly to the rental registration bylaw, which came through a, a set of four, spon four sponsors um, and was referred to CRC. And at that point, when it was referred to CRC, three of those sponsors were also members of CRC. So that worked out. I, I was not. Um, but at that point, CRC became the keeper of that body of work. It was no longer about the sponsors necessarily. And I think that's a little bit where, and maybe this is a bigger discussion around process where we're sort of trying to figure out how much of this gets held by, on behalf of the council, by the sponsors, um, and how much of it should just go to the committee it gets referred to and be held by that committee um, in terms of engaging with the community and setting up hearings and, and all of the things that I know happened in CRC with the rental registration. So I'm not sure how relevant it is, but just to say that I think there's some process piece here that might be um, just making this a little bit more challenging for us to figure out. I, let me just... Let me be very clear. The reason I would put it in a committee and therefore TSO is in fact to create maximum transparency. When you have maximum transparency, you hold committee meetings, you can have dialogues, you can do any number of other things, but it's in the public. And that's something I think we all subscribe to. Uh, Anika? I just had a question for clarity. I didn't hear the date. I'm, I'm looking at the TSO schedule. And uh, so could you just repeat the date that was suggested? Was that November December 20th? 20th. November. Sorry? November, November 20th. 20th. Shalini? Yeah, I'm wondering if we could do the TSO and TAC meeting along with public input on the September um, I think it's September 7th is our TSO meeting. 
And we can, I think that gives everyone enough time to publicize it and um, get TAC members or representatives of the TAC members to come to the GSO meeting. I, Shalini, I'm going to suggest we not try to solve that in the meeting tonight. Okay, fair. Okay. 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 I was just trying to say that just, okay, I was just going to say that because I think if we do it, let's say, assume if we do it in September, then couldn't we yeah. get it done by October? timeline yeah, yeah, sure. no perhaps okay. all and right i'm not always get it okay. done earlier but i I'm, I'm not going to try to sit here and schedule meeting schedule committee meetings and what's going on which agendas that's up to the committee chairs and the committees pat uh yes i may be throwing a tiny little silver monkey wrench into some of this um i think that the public input has been rich and varied. And even tonight in public comment, we saw the divisions between people who, you know, who feel one way about uh, the lighting and dark skies and people who are concerned, they support that, but are concerned about safety. Those people are, those people, a ah, horrible phrase. There seems to be, uh, I think there can be some efficiency if TSO is meeting about this, they could include a representative from TAC and they could include Eve Vogel, who has done really deep research in all of this and has a rich commitment and a deep commitment to finding a way to create a win-win situation where pedestrians and and car, uh, cars and and uh, bicyclists are protected, and yet we have we are protecting and we're encouraging dark skies. If you look at everything that she's been writing and all the the quality of her research, she and she, she's trying to do something that uh, it's very difficult for this town to do to create a collaborative solution. So damn it, add her to a TAC meeting and a um, representative of TAC and let that committee work. The sponsors have done an incredible job and need to be supported for that work, not necessarily have it taken away from them, but to find a way to participate deeply with with TSO and with these two uh, re uh, two representatives, um, I I'm sure this is going to get distorted. <laughs> I'm not trying to stop public dialogue, but I do not believe, given the volume of um, reaction we've had, that we need to have more dialogue to show this division. We need to have a meeting of people who are going to find a way to analyze this and find out where there are conflicts and make this work. And, and that's so forget all the extra hooey. Pat, I appreciate that. Again, I leave that to the chairs of the committees as to how they want to arrange their committees. So uh, Paul, has there been a formal addition? So there's a motion to right. Refer the Shalini's motion to refer to TSO and that TSO would consult with individuals and um, consult with TAC. Uh, yes. But the date hasn't changed. So it's still October 2nd, if you want. So that it's October I would like, 2nd. I would like to suggest a friendly amendment of October of November 20th. I accept. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Shalini. Yeah, I that's fine. And who was the second? Pam, second Pam, 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 Pam was the second. Pam Rooney, do you accept that? Okay. So the motion to amend that is on the floor at this time adds to the existing two committees uh, a re, a, that it goes to TSO and it extends the date to November 20th. Is there any question about the motion to amend? Seeing none, I'm going to start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, aye. Mindy Johanneke. Aye. 
Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Pam Rooney. I'm sorry, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yeah. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Bell Milne. Yes. Okay, and now we're back to the original motion. Paul, do you want to try to give me the original motion? Sure. Um, that under, this is Andy's motion as amended twice, that under rules, uh, under 7.1, uh, paren 7 of the rules of procedure, that the motion be, po the measure be postponed to a vote on November 20th, 2023, um, and that it would be referred to the GOL Finance Committee and TSO, and TSO will consult with individuals and uh, TAC. Okay, that is now the motion that we're voting on. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. No. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Galani Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. The motion passes unanimously with all counselors present. We are going to take a break. I did not come up with a slide um, for a break, Anna, um, but we will take a break. Please uh, be back and with your cameras on at 8.35. And don't forget to mute. I'll make a quick, I'll make a quick slide.
As you return, please turn your videos on so I know that you're back. Lynn, I'm here. I'm just leaving my video off. Thank you. And Anna, when you get back, can you take the screen down? Thank you. you're back, please turn your video on so I know that you're back. Jesus. As you come back, please turn your video on so I know you're back. Jennifer, I just saw you. Kathy, Alicia, are you back? Yes, I'm here. Okay. So, Kathy, are you back? Okay, we're going to move on to um, revision of bylaw 3.5, residential renter, rental property and regulations. I've listed this as a first discussion um, that let me just give a small history and then turn this over to um, CRC. Uh, there was, a group of four counselors who were initially discussion, discussing some form of change to the rental bylaws. Um, three of those people were members of CRC and still are members of CRC. And so it became important to, for the conversation to official, officially take place in the CRC committee. They have done that and they have done a lot of work which they bring forward to us today. And in addition to that, they have kindly made sure that all of this material was available to counselors well over a week before tonight's meeting. So um, we're not going to have a quote slide presentation, uh, but I am going to turn it over to Mandy Joe and Pam Rooney um, who are going to talk about the rental bylaw. And then we do have a couple of motions regarding referrals, okay? Thank you. Um, first off, I, I wanna thank John Thompson and Rob Mora. Um, we have been working on this for 16 months and one or both of them, I believe has attended every CRC meeting that this has been discussed at except one. Um, they've made a huge effort to attend the meetings, to review the regulations, to review the bylaw, to offer their input with what they think would work or not work when we were going through different variations and different proposals, to offer their input on what they would like to see in the bylaw itself and in the regulations, um, what they thought was necessary for them. Um, and also just their experience with the current bylaw, um, enforcement of it, what works and what doesn't with the current bylaw and all of it. I can't thank them enough 
for everything they've done for CRC and all of the time they've taken out for it. It's especially bittersweet to say that because John Thompson has his last day in about two weeks. Um, he is retiring after a massive amount of time with the town as a wonderful um, inspector and employee and just overall good person. Um, so we will miss him not just on CRC, but, but we thank him for all his work. I also want to thank the committee, because as you will have seen from the two reports that were written, the recommendations coming out of the committee are unanimous. Um, as anyone that knows this council will know, this committee has a lot of very varied views and opinions on housing in this town and on rental housing in this town and just a lot of things in this town, zoning in this town. We got to a unanimous recommendation in no small part because we were all willing to give a little, take a little, listen, learn, and work together to get to where we are today. So I wanted to thank the committee for that. Now, where are we? We've got two, two recommendations for essentially a passage to approve a bylaw and a regulation, um, proposed bylaw and proposed regulation. And we have a recommendation to refer the third part of this, the fee schedule, and there's a bunch of documents that go with it, to finance committee. The bylaw um, is a recommendation to adopt, uh, rescind the current and adopt the proposed. Um, the biggest changes in this bylaw um, are the inspection requirement. Right now, the current bylaw has a self-inspection requirement, a self-certification where the property owner certifies that it, the property complies with all state, local building codes, zoning codes, fire codes, health codes. And the proposed bylaw will change that to a town inspection done by a town official from our inspectional services, inspection services department um, and done generally once every five years with some when you get to the regulations, um, with some possibilities of certain properties being inspected nearly every year or every year or every two years or every three years, but every rental unit um, looking at those regulations would get inspected at least once every five years. Um, the other change that is larger than sort of the clearing up of some things is the enforcement mechanisms. We have set forth some additional enforcement mechanisms make, making it clearer what can be um, a, a penalty essentially, what can be a penalty and what cannot be a penalty. Um, a couple of things to point out that we've written who this applies to very carefully. It was one of the biggest conversations and some of the longest conversations we had was what rentals should this apply to and how do we get the wording right? Because what our department employees, John and Rob wanted to see and what we wanted to see was to ensure that um, particularly non-dorm rentals uh, that might be on university property are inspected. Our inspection services department has said that dorms under state law are inspected regularly. And we wanted to make sure that something like the P3 that is on Mass Ave and going up and coming into service would be included in this bylaw. And as of now, and as of what we understand the ownership and lease situation at that location is, that building would be subject to the bylaw as well as many other as well as all other rentals in town. Um, so I wanted to just make that one clear. I don't have much else to say on the bylaw. The report talks a little bit about some of the other changes and all. I'm happy to answer questions on that. On the regulations, um, I did tell John he reviewed the regulations since Thursday's meeting and said they look fine to him. The regulations are really sort of setting forth more of um, clarification on requirements. So that's where we get the frequency schedule of every five years. We've put some of that in the regulations because regulations are easier to tweak if something is deemed needing to be worked on or needing to be changed. It can be done a little quicker with a little more flexibility than if it's in a bylaw. And so if we decide that, or if the town decides that five years might be too infrequent, it can be changed to a three-year inspection requirement through the regulations. If we decide we really need to have the rental property owners being asked a question on how many um, plumbing 
hookups they have in their unit, we can add that to a rental application quite quickly. Um, uh, if it's in a regulation versus if it's in a bylaw. Um, and, you know, and the appeals, this, how an appeals works is the same way. So that's basically what the regulations are. They go hand in hand. Uh, the recommendation is to adopt them essentially together. Um, the bylaw says that if the, once the right, that the town council would adopt the regulations first, and then once they are adopted, the board of licensed commissioners would have the authority to amend them afterward. That is done and proposed because of a conversation and guidance of this council months ago that you may or may not remember about regulations and fees. Um, the fee structure, our recommendation on that is to send it to finance. Um, and ask for finance to come back with a recommendation on the actual fees to charge. We have proposed a structure, and that is the document that is in the packet. That structure took a lot of conversation about trade-offs, um, pros and cons of different versions. I just put some of those questions in the supplemental report about what we had to answer and decide on on what a structure might look like. Um, our, why we're recommending sending it to finance is because through that conversation, when we started talking about fees, we were being guided by guidance that we received from the council to propose a structure that would be cost neutral to the town, meaning that all fees, uh, that, that the fees received and the fee revenue would cover 100% of the costs of this bylaw enforcement and um, uh, implementation. In looking at the fee structures, as you will see in the Excel spreadsheet, that's a PDF, but it's from an Excel spreadsheet. When you look at options, the estimated cost of the program is about $450,000 to run the program, which will require three new inspectors estimated by Rob Mora. Um, to get to that number right now, we bring in about 150,000. We could, as CRC, get to a point where we thought we had a decent and a, a logical application fee structure and numbers. That is option one in the charts. But when we looked at inspections, you'll notice that there's a couple of options and none of them really get up to $300,000 or one of them might get close. And that's with like $400 per inspection and fees. And we realized as CRC that our charge is not to discuss that guidance and maybe recommend a different guidance, but we were struggling with all of the recommendations we got from the public, all of the input we got from the public and the guidance received from the council on making it neutral. So our recommendation is to send the structure to finance to have a conversation on determining whether that guidance that this program should be completely cost neutral should stand or whether essentially there's new justification for covering some of the costs through operational budgets and other receipts in the town like property taxes or um, strategic partnership agreements or you know anything else that goes into getting us to our operating operational budget and the revenues we received input from the public that it would be um, that it's logical to in cover some of the costs through that operational budget because all residents benefit from the program, not just those residents that rent and those property owners who rent, um, who own property that are rentals, that, that all residents will benefit from this new program. And so, but it's, we believed in CRC, it was within finances per view to make a recommendation on how much the fees should cover and then come up with the recommendation recommended fees. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, if Pam wants to add anything, she may, and then we can have a conversation. Pam? Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I would say also that to balance out the work that was done um, by the CRC in terms of the bylaw and in terms of regulations and fee, there was another component that um, was uh, sort of a spinoff. It was, it was one of the drivers of tackling the registration program. And that was um, 
a, a reconsideration of our nuisance bylaw that a nuisance, uh, I think, was one of the drivers of um, why we felt that the bylaws needed upgrading anyway. And we did not uh, ultimately include nuisance factors, if you will, behavior, um, mismanagement of properties and that kind of thing. We did not include within this bylaw. So this is a cleaner rental registration program with an upgrade of our nuisance property bylaw as a, as a secondary effect, essentially like having to create regs, we also created this um, a greatly improved nuisance bylaw. Um, I would second Mandy that um, um, with help from Shalini, there was an extensive outreach program that um, that engaged the Engage Amherst program, and we got well over 250, I think, um, uh, responses from that 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 re reflected both renters, landlords, uh, and the neighbors. So um, it was pretty pretty inclusive and conclusive. Um, and I do hope that uh, if you have questions, you can answer them. So the floor is open for comments or questions. Dorothy. Um, I have one question. Um, you had um, reduced fee for owner occupied properties, which I totally understand. Um, but then also for anyone in town. And um, I remember hearing some of the comment from the public on this and, and I, they didn't say anyone in town, but it was like, well, what about if you're close by or if you have a rental unit adjacent or near or on your block? And I, I thought the reduction wasn't just that it's a town person, we like them, but that they, the, te the tenants would know who they are. They will know who the tenants are. And behavior is just better under those circumstances because we do have some local landlords that have unruly houses. Um, they I obviously do not live nearby because they wouldn't tolerate the uh, noise and chaos if they did. So that that's my only objection. Otherwise, I think it's absolutely fabulous work. So thank you. Is there any comment? Okay. Um, I have my hand up, so I'm going to, I thought I had my hand up. Maybe I don't. Okay, Kathy. Uh, or did Mandy Joe, did you want to comment on that? Um, I'll wait till after Kathy and then I'll make comments. Okay. Kathy? Um, yeah, I'll make comment questions. Um, this is, as you all well know, a voluminous amount of work to uh, read, go through, and cross list. So I'm going to focus on what I thought was the impetus initially, we know, and I think the town staff know that there are a handful, and I don't know how big a handful of properties that are perennial problems. And sometimes they're owned or managed by similar, and it's not all rental properties, and it's not necessarily the great big ones, you know, the multi-units. So I had always hoped we'd have a policy that could somehow zero in on them. Um, so my question is, is on the inspection side in the units, because I did find one town and I sent it in right at the beginning that varied their policy depending on whether the rental unit and or property owners were a perennial problem or concern, either because of complaints or because of safety or because of public health um, or police coming in regularly. And when they were those, there were more inspections than, and if they were complaint free um, for long periods of time. So we have five years, one year at the initial and then five years. My question is, why wouldn't you want to go longer than five years if you had a property that had been complaint free for all five years? Why would you inspect them again? Um, because it raises the cost of inspections. My second question is if you have a problem place and you're inspecting more, more frequently, could we bill the inspection costs to the property owner rather than um, and help finance? Could there be a way of doing that? And people would be alerted right from the beginning on what criteria. Then my third is um, how many units 
we inspect and the there's a standard that says under 25 units and i don't exactly know how you count a unit i think it's an apartment but an apartment might have five bedrooms or one but under 25 you inspect every single one of them over you can do random why 25 why wouldn't you do if it's a really small establishment inspect all but then as you get bigger uh, spot inspect because again it drives up the number of inspections and i'm not talking now the nuisance inspections if you're called that someone's worried about the electrical wiring or the plumbing so that those are my major and and i didn't do the rest much of a thorough view i was looking at the things that um raise the cost to the property owner and or to the town and whether we can moderate those to do what i initially said of try to zero in on the pockets that are problematic um however broadly the definition of problem problem is defined that's it and i'll reserve other comments for when i've read the whole thing because i see it's going to finance and i'll get another chance to think about all the other pieces thank you very much Lynn's Lynn. muted, but I'm going to guess that maybe she's calling on me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why there's all that. You were muted, Lynn. So I'm, I'm going to try and. I'm running two computers tonight. So sometimes I get the wrong one. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to try and answer all those questions. Um, to Dorothy, we had a lot of requests on a fee structure to. Um, recognize that owner adjacent properties as some people referenced them um were generally more well taken care of than um properties who have an owner that lives not in town or sometimes much farther away from town than next door but sometimes next door um, and so that part of the fee structure recommendation is an attempt to recognize that for small landlords that have that live in town but might live on a property on a parcel that is not the parcel they're renting um that they many times are close to as um well taken care of as an owner occupied property um but that so that's why there's a three unit limit to ownership in the town because we wanted to make sure we didn't include in that sort of line of fee structure those owners who live in town that own and really do run a rental property business as a huge going concern not as one or two units in town so that that was that attempt there, we recognize it might not be a perfect way of doing it, um, but it, it was our attempt at threading the needle there. Um, to Kathy, so the five year is um, was a standard that was, we had originally had three, we moved it up to five at the request of Rob. Um, the town department is the one that believed that that was the most um well believe that that was a good number of years to be able to get into every unit um there is within the regulations within that five year the ability for there's a couple of reasons why that five year would not hold even if there weren't complaints so um one is if the building commissioner believes the property needs inspected more frequently than every five years in order to obtain a permit. So one one thing that our building commissioner has said is that they are generally aware of which properties might be more problematic um, and that they wanted the option to inspect them more frequently than the standard five-year inspection frequency. Another thing we wrote in is, um, Pam hinted at this with her comments, is one of the reasons to 
garner an inspection more frequently than every five years will be a violation of the nuisance bylaw. We know our nuisance bylaw rewrite is not done yet. We are working on it um, and we will begin working on it in earnest. We've we've reviewed it a couple times already, but we will work on it in earnest now that this one's at the council. Um, but we've written in that the, the, we've really tailored the rental registration permitting to health and safety code enforcement um, building codes, health codes, and all of that, but we recognize that uh, nuisance, non-building code nuisances can be a harbinger of issues related to a property, and so we've written in that a nuisance property violation could be a reason that the building commissioner would um, mandate a more frequent inspection schedule to renew a permit than every five years. He could do that once a year if he deemed it necessary because of all these other nuisance violations. So we've tried to write that into it to get that, um, what what you were saying is on, if it's been a perennial concern, how do we get in there more frequently? We've tried to ensure that that's in within the regulations on the frequency schedule. And in terms of billing for extra in inspection costs to the owners, the fee schedule, um, sets forth multiple fees and different fees. Well, finance will make a recommendation, but we have listed a fee for an initial inspection the very first time you get a permit, which um, Rob and his department have said actually takes more time than a renewal inspection if you're going for, if you're renewing your permit and you need your inspection five years later, that that one will take less time. So that might have a different fee, but then for complaint inspection. So, um, when there's a complaint that will have a separate fee. We've proposed a CRC to finance that each of those three inspection fees include a follow-up inspection in case the inspection has failed. Um, but if you need two follow-up inspections, that second one, if you fail the second, the first follow-up inspection, if you were cited for five violations, you come back in a month and there's now three violations instead of five, when you come back in a month to look at those three, that one will charge another inspection. So we think we've covered that, that ability for the people who are getting inspections to pay for the inspections um, within the fee structure, although depending on the fee set, we don't know how much it will cover that. That will be up to finance. But we've written in the ability, if you're having more inspections, you will pay more because you'll pay for each of the inspections instead of just paying one flat fee that covers all six inspections or something. I hope that answers all the questions. Jennifer. Thank you. You're muted. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess just to add on to what... Um, Mandy said that we really were following the recommendations of our building and safety department. And they thought that every five years wouldn't be too onerous, but that would ensure that we knew that the, you know, um, apartments, duplexes, triplexes that were being rented out were in fact uh, safe and um, healthy and, you know, met all our inspection, you know, all our safe health and safety standards. And I guess one example was, I think it's actually in your district, Kathy, of you know, the there's currently a proposal for a special permit before the Zoning Board of Appeals, 798 to 800 North Pleasant Street. Um, in 20, the same property owners have owned a duplex that's currently there since 2004, has had, you know, like five pages of uh, noise and nuisance complaints and other violations. And in 2020, in fact, it was cited for not being fit for human habitation. So we kind of use that as an asked Rob, you know, would our revised zoning, we just asked him at the last meeting, kind of prevent that situation from happening. And he said the problem there was because there weren't mandatory inspections and it was only complaint driven they many years went by before they were finally called to go to the property. And so they felt that, you know, and we may find that, you know, after, you know, maybe a period of five years or more that for certain properties that are, you know, inspected once every five years and there's no violations that maybe we can extend that, but that, you know, our st staff thought that the five years was a good place to start and that we could ensure then, you know, that, you know, every property that is rented is inspected and that we could, you know, kind of vouch for that they had met health and safety standards. And I guess one other example is next door to Dorothy on Amity and Lincoln, there's a, 
a big property, I think it owned by a major, you know, um, property owner and landlord in town. I think maybe 17 students live there. And five or six or more years ago, there was a fire a few weeks after school ended. And this was reported in the Gazette that it hadn't been inspected in more than 10 years because we didn't have systematic inspections. And I remember when that happened thinking, you know, if I sent my child went to school in Amherst, I would want to be assured that wherever they were, whatever apartment they were renting, that, you know, it met all health and safety, um, you know, standards that the town has set. So we wanted to perhaps err on the side of caution, but we were advised that five years was a good place to start and then we can always revisit it. That's it, thanks. Uh, Kathy, did you have a follow-up question? I just a, a response to what they were asking, Lynn, but if you want to go first, that's fine. I want, um, I want to stay on the same top. I was on the same topic of frequency of inspections, who bears the cost and uh, targeting. Um, and I'm drawing somewhat from nursing home policy too, that states learned a lot from this, but others yeah, can go. Please go ahead. My, my questions and observations actually are not in that area. Okay, so I just, so I did ask, you know, what, why every unit under 25? And I do understand five to me is better than three. I, I have no problem with that. And it's more, if, if, if you start to really know your properties, which that first inspection will give you, uh, and if it's owner occupied, longer time periods may be warranted and use use your nuisance law and others as I absolutely agree with that's a that's a signal that maybe something's going on um, to get inside and inspect the property for other reasons and I when I first ran as counselor was a person who bought a house down the road said she tried to rent and she wanted the counselor to know that you have some slumlords in town and that there was loose wiring, rats, mold. I mean, she listed a bunch of things that she said, we just couldn't rent them. Um, and to the extent we know about them, I think we should clean them up. One of the things the nursing home industry learned in some states, but not all, is target your inspections. Um, do them randomly, you know, sometimes surprise. And if you have a well-performing institution, uh, tr tread lightly because you want to keep them. Um, and, if, and this is very vulnerable residents. They can't even speak for themselves. And the other thing was pull their license. And so I'm also wondering why you would keep permitting someone. And I originally thought there is a permit fee if you have one strike against you, you get a warning. If you have two strikes, it's doubled. If you have three strikes, at some point we yank it. Um, you know, so so just trying to think of carrots and sticks is, um, and as I said, I haven't read it all. So that's the way I'm thinking to to focus and target, especially where there's cost to more people being hired in the town. That's it. Um. Hold on. Um, so, um, first of all, I want to thank the committee, and I also want to thank um, the initial sponsors and the staff who put in so much time on this. Um, I, I actually spent a fair amount of time scouring the bylaw, and uh, because of that, I actually do want it referred to GOL because I don't want to sit here tonight and go into what does this mean or what does that mean? Um, but but I, I made a couple observations and one is, and, and they lead to questions, okay? First of all, um, I, this does seem to place a little more uh, responsibility on the Board of License Commissioners. And maybe that's... Um, fine and that you, you know, I, I know you've talked to them. Uh, I just wanted to recognize that it does place a little more responsibility on the Board of License Commissioners. Um, I also was glad to see that subsidized housing was exempt because of the federal review that takes place. It, it seriously covers the territory. And so I found those kinds of things really important. 
I'd like you to talk a little bit about the issue of number of people occupying and number of bedrooms. I mean, in my district, I know there's at least one house where there's four bedrooms and seven cars. And does this get at that issue? And then I, I frankly just don't remember, have we ever gone out on legal review? And at what point did we go out on legal review? Thank you. Dorothy, unless Mandy Joe wanted to address some of those. I just want to tie up something that, that Jennifer said. Um, sometimes things go right, okay? So the house next door, I don't know if it had other problems, but it's fire alarm worked. There weren't any people in the house and the fire alarm kept going on. Um, people didn't know what it was, but it went on. And the town fire department did a great job. So when things are done properly, lives are saved, buildings are saved. Um, and it's very important that this legislation um, get passed. Uh, it's been a great. Dorothy, you, mute, you muted accidentally. It kind of it did it to me. Uh, I love the fact that the, the people who take care of this were input day by day and, and really worked on it. So I think this is a really great piece of work. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few more little touches here and there, but um, I'm really happy with it. So thank you. Mandy Joe. Okay, I've highlighted the questions now, so hopefully I won't miss any. Um, why the 25? So 25 is a number that we, you know, in some sense it's a residual number, but it's also a number in terms of the, the when, when you split from a minimum for large apartment complexes, at what point do you say we're not doing all of them? We're only going to do a subset. And most, many of the towns we looked at did that split at 25. So that's that's why the up to 25 is a full number. Um, there's been a change at, and and prior prior to the current version, after 25, it was it was a minimum of 25, but 25% every year. And so it would be 25 until you got to 100 units. And then if you had 150 units, it would be something like that. And then you'd, you'd end up with an inspection every, every unit every four years. Um, with the change to inspection every five years, the town attorney recommended that we clarify the units. The goal is to get into every unit every five years. And so once, once you hit 25, then the new regulations say, for larger complexes enough to ensure that you are inspecting every unit every five years without setting a specific target every year for buildings above 25. So if you have up to 25 units, you could you will have them all done in one year. And if you pass, and if our department says, we're not concerned about this property, you won't have any inspections for five years. You'll come, well, you won't have a initial, a renewal inspection for five years. Um, if there's complaints, you'll be there, but you'll you'll get one big inspection once every five years. Um, for the larger complexes above 25 units, this will actually allow our department to say, well, instead of doing in in a 150 unit, we have I, I think it's three, maybe six units of uh, complexes that are between 100 and 150 units. Well, instead of if we have five, say instead of doing a, a twenty percent of every of each of those complexes every every year, we can do one full complex every year. So it will give our department a choice to say, well, we're going to do fifty percent this year, fifty percent next year, and then nothing every th for three years. We're going to do it all this year because we have five of these types of large buildings and we're just going to spend our time in Puffton one year and then in Brandywine the next and then that or our department can choose to say we're going to do 20 percent every year so that we get into that building that that complex every year with a subset of the unit so it gives them a uh some options is there a pool their license yes there is um but but Rob had wanted it to be May and our attorney recommended May's not shells in some of these to to you know, and so um, once you hit three notices of violations in three years, within three years, Rob can decide to suspend or revoke the permit. 
Um, and if it's suspended or revoked and, and the, we've, we don't, we have some specifics on how long the first suspension is, but then we get long. So, so, and if it's under suspension, you cannot renew your permit. So if it's suspended because of, because there were three violations for notices of violations within three years and Rob did decide to suspend the permit and that's a six month suspension that would come in through the renewal. Well, they wouldn't be able to renew their permit until after that suspension is finished. Um, so that is in there. Um, it may need, we, we had received, Rob and his department indicated they have never suspended a permit in the 10 years of it because they don't like suspending permits. So the suspension issue, was another one we spent a lot of time on of, do we make it, we had attorney review that said, if you do do suspensions, you need a lot of due process and you need to work on all of that. And it gets very complicated. And a lot of the suspensions can't actually happen until the lease term is up. So you're actually suspending the permit, not for the current residents and maybe not even for the landlord because the landlord could just change ownership to a different owner, even though they might be the different owner and then it wouldn't apply or there'd be also other issues. There were a lot of issues with suspension. So we tread lightly with it. To Lynn's questions, the BLC has been reviewing these drafts since we started including them. They have had their input. They have said what they liked about their inclusion or what they didn't like. We've modified it because of all of that. They have at this point signed off on all of it. I've been in constant contact with Marion Walker, the chair, and she has the versions that are in the packet today and will be with a final, she had the attorney review ones and she'll be talking with them finally and knows when to get additional feedback back to us if there's anything they do wanna change, but they have seen basically this version before the attorney review. Um, subsidized housing, I just wanted to clarify that it's not fully exempt. They will need a permit under right. the system. And Rob will get to choose whether they actually need inspections. He actually didn't want a full exemption from inspections because he sometimes has seen instances where despite the federal inspection and the federal inspectors coming in, there were some town issues that needed corrected. And so he wanted the option to choose whether to need that inspection or not. So it's a may um, up to our town department. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, number of people occupying bedrooms and does this get to the issue? So, um, not necessarily. I'm sure Pam and Jennifer will have it. it. It's hard. We talked a lot about this, right? There's a zoning. So, so to get an inspection, you have to comply with the zoning and the zoning bylaw has a definition in there that defines family as certain related individuals, or if there's unrelated, no more than four unrelated. So if it's obvious that it's not in compliance with that, the permit should not be granted because the requirement in the bylaw is that you comply with that. It is not though one of the reasons to suspend or revoke a permit in the bylaw. So if you have the permit in general, it will not be suspended or revoked if a violation is found of it later. We've we talked a lot about application questions that could get to this issue, a lot about how to start tracking some of this and figuring some of it out. And it's a very complicated issue. I, I would say on a personal non-chair level, I think we've tried to thread that needle pretty well. It's not perfect. And one of the reasons it's not perfect is because our building inspector has indicated that even if he cites someone for that violation, when he gets to court and the court asks and, and someone challenges that particular rule because there's five and the court asks, well, is it unsafe to have five individuals in there? If he does not feel the building is unsafe for an occupancy of five, he cannot testify that it, it is unsafe. He will not testify that way. And generally, if he cannot testify that way, the court will throw out that violation. Um, so it's it's a complicated issue. We've tried to do the best we can with it, I would say. Um, 
and nuisance, we're, we're dealing with that issue under the nuisance review, nuisance by law review too. So this is not the end of it, I would say. Um, legal review, yes, those are actually in the packet. So, and, and you asked which version it was. Basically the version before this one, I think there's a number, I think they were like, say they were version eight and you're seeing version 10. Nine was essentially the same as 10. Um, there Thank were you. various, so yeah. Yep. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify at what point, and maybe I just didn't get to that level of detail in everything you sent us, but thank you so much. Uh, Andy. Yeah, I thought long and hard about whether to make this observation, but I think I really need to as a matter of uh, first reading and just being an understanding of what it is that we're being asked to consider. And the reason I was hesitant was because it's also being referred to the Finance Committee, and I want to make it very clear that this has not been discussed with the Finance Committee at all. We have not taken this up because it hasn't been referred, and I've not talked with anybody. But I just want to point out something that's very obvious. This is a significant financial uh, change for the town. And... Uh, for us to adopt it without recognizing that significance, I think, um, is not doing our job as counselors. Uh, Mandy pointed out that the uh, uh, suggestion from Rob Mora was that the additional inspectors would cost approximately $475,000 per year and that it would be divided in some fashion between new revenue and um, revenue that we would otherwise find in the budget. To give you some context to that, the $475,000, I'll give you two comparisons or three comparisons. One comparison is CRESS. CRESS is funded at $642,000. The library operating budget for three branches of the library, the amount of the town contribution to the library, not the total library budget, but the town contribution is 2214000 And the third number that I wanted you to remember is that we spent time in the spring focusing on a request from the schools for elementary schools for additional funding and ended up saying no, that um, we did not fund it. And that was a finance committee recommendation and the council decision. Their request was $84,000. So when you're talking about a $475,000 additional expense, um, I, I really urge council as it's thinking about this between the first and second reading to give serious consideration to to those dollar amounts. And uh, yes, some of it will be generated by um, fees, no doubt. I, um, again, can't say that with certainty as to what it is, having not um, had any discussion whatsoever on the Finance Committee. But there was a lot of concern when we were uh, talking about the debt exclusion, about the impact of increased costs for landlords on rents that are being charged by the landlords. And that doesn't necessarily just go to uh, any um, single group of landlords, but it, it gets to some extent shared across landlords. And I know it's a complex question that needs to be discussed, but I just felt I'm compelled to point out that this is a significant expense of a significant additional change in what the town is doing and the cost. And the, we need to understand what the cost comparisons are and what we're going to be able to do or not do, in, uh, whether it be capital like roads and sidewalks, which is the perennial concern or anything else that we do. So that's my comment. Oops, thank you. Uh, 
I'm going to suggest that I place the following motion on the floor to refer proposed revisions to general bylaw 3.5 residential rental property and the proposed regulations for general bylaw 3.5 residential rental property to the governance organization and legislation committee to review for clarity, consistency, and actionability with a report back to the town council within 45 days. Is there a second? Well, second, but point of order, that yes. zero after the five is very important. We have a 3.5 bylaw and a 3.50 bylaw. Ah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> 3.50 bylaw. <laughs> okay, wow. Uh, one would hope we wouldn't do that too often. Um, it, so it's been sec uh, made and seconded. Are there any other questions regarding that motion? Kathy? I, it's a simple question, Lynn. If during the finance review, we attack the issue Andy just rose and those raised, and that was my question about frequency, how often and targeting because of the costs. Um, does GOL need to review again, or would GOL be less focused on fees and focus? You know, so I'm trying to avoid a double review. I, I don't. I don't think they need to review again. We're referring a different document to uh, finance, and we're referring the bylaws themselves to GOL. Um, and the you know the chairs can decide to wait till the finance review, which could be happening as early as um, the 22nd of August. So I don't think there's an issue with such sequencing. Mandy Jo, did you have a comment? No, I was just gonna comment that this is not a referral of the bylaws or the bylaw or regulations to finance. In fact, there isn't a motion on, right. on the sheet to refer those to finance, just the fee schedule for creation of fees is on the is on right. the motion sheet to refer to finance, not the bylaw and regulations themselves. There's there's two motions that I'm trying to work with here. This one is clear, consistent, and actionability, and that's GOL. There's a second motion on the motion sheet, and that is about the fees. Kathy? Okay, then maybe this is for the second motion. I won't, don't want it just to be the fees, but it's also the frequency of inspections. Um, you know, so it's not just a fee schedule, it's also frequency. So I think both of those need to go to finance. That's where it gets to 475000 Okay. Um, okay. I just, however, you, however you word that, I, you know, as I said, we've got all these parts. So some part of one of those might be in not in the fee part. So that's it. I'll stop. Got it. All right. There is a motion on the table. It's been made and seconded. It is to refer proposed re proposed revisions to general bylaw 3.50 <laughs> and et cetera. Is there any other question on that one? Seeing none, then I'm going to move to a vote. And I'm going to start with Lynn Griesmer. I'm an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Uh, Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? No. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shelly yes. Balmill? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. It's unanimous. All right. The second motion is to refer to the Finance Committee the document titled Rental Registration Fee Schedule Proposed Revision 6B 2023-08-03 and Fee Schedule Samples 2023-08-03 for a recommendation on the fees to charge under General Bylaw 3.50 Residential Rental Property with a report to the town council by October 16th, 2023. Is there a second? Second, Haneke. Are there any questions or comments? May, uh, Kathy. 
Yeah, I think that's too narrow as I'm reading them because I think the frequency of inspections, um, Mandy, you can tell me wh what part of the regulations it's in, but I don't think it's in the fee schedule. The frequency of inspections is in regulations, not the fee schedule. So, so Lynn, I don't know how to word it, but, th but those aspects of the regulations that affect costs would also be reviewed by finance is what I just, I just want the, the two pieces, however that gets worded. So uh, we would insert in the motion to refer to the finance committee, the documents and after, um, Anna, you might want to pull this one up. Um, for recommendations and the fees charged, comma, and um, the proposed regulations for general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property um, with regard to number of an, number of frequency of inspections. I was going to say, I, I can, I don't have it. Paul's been tracking the motions. And so I don't know. Is that what you're asking to pull up? Is the motion being made? Yeah. Paul, are you okay with this motion? Um, just want to, can you say it again? I mean, I, I think you want to so, track it to the prior motion that was just voted, right? Yeah, but it's, it's to after uh, point of order. Yeah. I will not, it, when seeking as a motion maker, I guess a friendly amendment to tack to the current motion of referring to finance and I as the seconder will not accept that friendly amendment. So it needs to be a motion to amend. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, the motion on the floor then is the one as it appears on the motion sheet. And that's to refer to the finance committee, the document titled Rental Registration Fee Schedule Proposed Revision 6B 2023-08-30 and Fee Schedule Samples 2023-08-03 for a recommendation on the fees to charge under General Bylaws 3.50 Residential Rental Property with a report to the Town Council by October 16, 2023. Um, that's been made and seconded. Uh, if somebody else would like to craft an amendment, I'm more than fine with that. Pam Rooney. I was going to clarify for Kathy, um, for Kathy, that the the fee schedule is um, it can be it's it's a it's a formula, and you can look at at a variation of the timing of fees and the the frequency of such fees, and do the math. So it's. Um, I think that's a discussion that would be helpful for you to have. Um, as as in, do more uh, does does a more frequent schedule actually cost the town a lot more, or is there is there because we would we would associate a fee with an inspection, so it's not as though there is no income for for inspections. Kathy? Uh, I don't think I completely understand why that is true. So I think what I'm being told is that you've made this motion. I need to propose an amendment to your motion that adds, and those sections uh, on frequency in, in the 3.50 that relate to costs. I just don't want finance's hands to be tied and we say, oh no, you were just supposed to do this section. You can't overgo in this section. I want to be able to look at both because the two combined are what yields three full-time inspectors, um, including Lynn. We just heard the there's a May decision to inspect federal housing. You know, so if our inspector likes to inspect, they might just start to inspect more. You know, there's, there's costs involved. So I'm willing to make a, a motion to amend LINS to include a cross-reference to the other, if that's what I need to do, unless I have permission in finance to talk about the other sections. If I have permission, I'm fine. I'm on finance, so. 
if you're going to propose a change to the bylaw, I mean, to the regulations, because this only is, from what I'm understanding, this only is a matter of being in the regulations. It's not in the bylaw. If you're going to propose a change to the uh, bylaw based on the financial review, then the regulations would have to be referred to finance. Then I, want, then I want to make a motion to amend. Okay, Jennifer, did you have a comment? It's more a question. So um, CRC is recommending based on, you know, input from our building and inspections department, inspections every five years. So finance could come back with figures for how to support a program with a five-year inspection. I, I suppose couldn't finance also say, but if you wanted to spend less and you did it every seven years, I mean, I guess the council will vote to whether we want to approve spending at different levels. So couldn't couldn't wouldn't finance, you know, have the leeway to do that. We would certainly want them to come back with a fee schedule that reflects every five years. And if that was too expensive and they also, you know, said, well, you would save X amount if you did it every seven years and that the council would. So wouldn't they have that leeway within the current motion is I guess my I, question. I personally believe they would, but I want to be very clear and I'm actually going to look to Andy and, and Paul and others to say, do you feel like the regulations need to be referred as well? Andy, Paul? I think if the finance committee is going to make a recommendation on changing the regulations, that would have to be referred to the finance committee because right now what's being referred to the finance committee is the fee schedule. Um, right. Yeah. That that was my initial thought, even though I think we have the leeway. Uh, so Kathy has made a motion and I just want to be more precise with the motion. And yeah. that is, uh, and you need to use the words and the proposed regulations for general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property. That is the title of what you're trying to refer. And you wanted to refer it for specific purposes. So Kathy, if you could repeat your amendment using those words. Okay, adding to Lynn's amendment and this I'm proposed, reg proposed regulations 3.50 residential rental property regulations regarding the frequency of inspections. Is there a second? Second, okay. Anna has seconded that. Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. It's not going to be a surprise since I wouldn't let it be a friendly amendment that I'm going to oppose this amendment. Um, CRC has made a recommendation to adopt a five year inspection program. If the council, when it finds out the fees on what might need to be charged under a five year program based on what may or may not be able to be absorbed within the operating budget or not after consultation with the director, um, with the finance director and the town manager, if they come back with fees and the council looks at those fees and says, wow, this program is too expensive, what can we do to change it? my recommendation would be to send that back to CRC because CRC is the body that should be discussing or uh, someone could argue maybe TSO, but finance is not the body that should be discussing the substance of the regulations as it relates to frequency of inspections and recommending a different frequency. That's within the purview and the expertise of at this point, CRC, who has spent 16 months discussing how frequent these inspections need to be with the building commissioner and the uh, John Thompson, our chief inspector. Um, and so I don't think, I don't agree with the finance committee re-looking at the frequency of inspections and saying, 
well, we think it should be 10, or we think it should be three, or we think it should be this. What finance can do is come back with the fees on this and allow the council to say, is that too expensive or not? And so I'm gonna vote against the motion to amend. Andy. This is a difficult topic and I really, and I guess that uh, what I would encourage Mandy to think about in response to what she just said is that all the time we end up through the budget process, whether it be at the first stages when we're setting the guidelines or when we um, are reacting to what the town manager does with the guidelines and presents to us for the budget adoption is that um, we have to make decisions as to whether we think that any program that we're funding um, justifies the amount of money that's being requested in comparison to other things that are also being requested. And, uh, you know, there's no department in town that would not, when we talk to them, say we really could use more staff uh, we really could use more police officers we could use more firefighters we could use more crest off crest uh, responders we could use more teachers in our schools um, we get you know we hear that from virtually every department and at some point we have to have a budget process that takes the departmental um, wish list and through the town manager and through the council boils that down to an amount that is supportable um, and that ends up being the final budget. And I think that what's bothering uh, about this and what Kathy is getting at and what I'm beginning to wonder about is how do those kinds of decisions fit in with this um, discussion we're having now? We're creating a process for inspections that may be more that the town can afford, but we haven't figured out how we're going to deal with um, that issue. And which then gets back to you pour it all into um, additional um, fees. Well, uh, we know that fees don't cover all expenses um, normally. Um, they, they occasionally they do, but not normally, not not in every situation. And uh, how how do we uh, um, justify the amount of um, increase in rents that is going to happen as a result of what we do? I think that as a council. We need to grapple with this. And I don't think that we're grappling with it very well. Um, Michelle? I was very much um, following Mandy and, and ve feeling very supportive of, of Mandy's position. And so, but I wanted to check myself. So I pulled up the finance committee charge. And I think it's relevant um, that in, in the seventh, bullet um, under the charge. It says, upon referral from the council, make recommendations on proposed bylaws, including revisions, policies, or other measures under council consideration with regard to the effect the measure will have on town revenues, expenses, or finances. Um, and to me, that speaks to the need for um, there to be some consideration. Um, I don't I can't say I know exactly the way that it should work, you know, policy, ver language versus um, this kind of consideration. But it, according to the charge, um, I, I do feel like reviewing it um, at the finance committee would be appropriate. Um, Jennifer? Um, you need to I think Pam had her hand up first. So I'll oh, I'm you. sorry, Pam. I'm I'm going back and forth. Pam. Thank you. Um, I I really appreciate Kathy and Andy's response to uh, the request for income review of this. 
it is it is another uh, input loop that we haven't had to date. And I think, you know, we've we've packaged this whole thing up pretty pretty tightly. Um, and now, you know, handing it over saying, and now do your part. Um, I, speaking just for myself, I am perfectly okay with finance committee looking at the whole package. I, if they come back and say, you know, I'm sorry, but your, you know, your, your regulations um, need to be adjusted. I think that is a conversation that we then have to, um, we have to have. It is, yes, we are making a recommendation based on lots of conversation, lots of discussion. The eff efficacy of a program is is pretty important. If you if you can't do it properly, do you even try to do it? And we have had, you know, we've had a a registration program in place for what 10 or 11, 12 years. Um, and we felt that it really it really needed upgrading. Um, I think when it goes to finance, it would be good to get their feedback. Um, so if we if if the finance committee is asking for the inclusion of the regulations, which is really you know where it's spelled out in the frequency, I would just say though that a town like Chatham inspects every year, every year across the board, everybody gets a quick check every year and it's like clockwork. Um, we've done 10 year with, with a five year um, suggestion because we have a lot of, we have a lot of rental units in town and we could, you know, if we had 10, if we had 10 inspectors, you know, they wouldn't have a heavy burden, but, but we, want to have as few inspectors as we possibly can have to make the program a success. I want to thank Paul for, for promoting the need for rental inspection when he developed the strategic agreement with, with UMass that they in fact could help cover some of the expense of this program because it is their off-campus students that make up such a, a huge percentage of the population. Um, I'll just stop there. Well, Jennifer, thank you for running the clock on me. <laughs> Jennifer. Yeah, I also wanted to say that, I mean, I agree with Mandy that the CRC spent a lot of time discussing this and we worked very closely with Rob Mora and John Thompson and we we, you know, a lot of thought and consideration and you know, research went into, you know, recommending every five years inspection. And I know when we did the engage Amherst survey responses, which I think was like last year, this time, a part of, you know, tenants wrote back and said that they were concerned about reporting um, health and safety violations where they lived because there was some concerned about, you know, would there be any kind of retaliation or, you know, how, what would it do to their, you know, um, relationship with their landlord. And so our building and safety said, you know, we really have to just systematically go in on a regular basis that that for all this time, we've had rental permitting since 2013 and all ins inspections are on are complaint driven. If somebody calls and says there is a problem, you know, where I live and short of that, that um, apartments and, you know, any rental units are not being inspected. And I guess echoing what Pam said, you know, we've always, you know, hope that the university would be able to help support this program. That is an option that, you know, we would like to pursue because they have such, a, I mean, of course they have an interest since so many of their students starting sophomore year move off campus. Uh, they need, you know, they would want to know, we would think that their students are living in safe and healthy um you know, houses and apartments off campus. And I would be, I don't see why the finance department couldn't come back and say, this is what it would cost for every five, five year inspections. This is what it would cost for seven. This is what it would cost for 10. But I don't think finance should maybe make that decision for us because CRC has asked, you know, that for 
finance to set actual fees based on a structure that we recommended for every five years. And certainly, I mean, I think if you came back and you know showed us some other options and then maybe it would, I don't know if the conversation would be in, council, in the council or it would go back to CRC to see if we can have an effective program that ensures that the rental units in town are meet are healthy and safe based on an inspection system that is less than every five years. So I guess I'm repeating what I said before, but I would like finance to come back with figures for every five years. And if you want to suggest, you know, a different, um, show us what a, a comparison would be with a less frequent or more frequent schedule that we would be receptive to that. But I think we would want to see what it would cost us for every five years because there we have um, mm -hmm. really thought through why we would want inspections to be on that schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah, so I, I really respect the the work of the CRC on this, and I think it's a really important initiative. Um, and as a member of the finance committee, I also think it would be important to be able to consider the regulations um, so that we can get a more realistic idea of how we can make this happen um, in the larger context of how it would actually function within the town budget. So I do hear what Jennifer's saying, and I agree in that, like, if they're asking for the recommendation for every five years, that is what we should look at when we're looking at the fee structures. But I don't think we should be limited to just that because it would be really important, I think, in like with the idea of moving this forward, that if there were a better context in which this would work for the town, that we should also be able to bring light to that. Not that it needs to be like a formal recommendation that we recommend you do X amount of years instead, but like this would be a more financially sound decision for our budget and that we would be able to say that like formally coming out of the finance committee. So I do agree with Kathy and that I think the wording maybe should be changed a bit so that we have the ability to consider that, but that doesn't mean we don't also give what you're asking for, which is the fee structure for the five years. So that like, it's not limiting us to just that. Dorothy. Um, I have no problem with the finance committee studying it and making some suggestions, but I do not want the finance committee to be in a position to kill the bill. That would be a very, very bad thing because I'm still very unhappy about the fact that um, we did not, I believe, vote properly on having on who pays for having letting individual homeowners pay for pipes and paving of public streets. Uh, that move that we spent a lot of time on is just seems to have disappeared. It's in limbo. Seems to have not be there. So I really this the finance committee can make a recommendation, but I hope it doesn't think it's its job to kill this proposal. This is essential if we are to be a really um, forward-thinking college town, we have to ensure that we're doing our best, the town is doing its best to maintain safe uh, housing for students to live in. Um, that's it. Thank you. Mandy Joe. My issue with this motion is that it's it's seeking to add the regulations only on the frequency inspection of inspection for I don't even know whether it's a recommendation on whether they the finance committee supports that frequency or not. It's not a rep, you know, that's my problem with this amendment. I might be able to support a referral to finance for a recommendation on the bylaw itself and regulations itself as a whole. But the frequency of inspections is not the only part of this entire package that affects the cost of the program. What you're inspecting affects the costs of the program. The number of units you do which is kind of related to frequency, but I'm not even sure it's in the frequency part of the regulations. It might be in a slightly different section of it. Um, how long the permit is for, 
affects the cost of the program? Are you applying every year such that every year we have to review all of those applications and not? Or is the application and permit good for two years? How long is the, you know, there's so many parts of this bylaw that go into implementing and the cost of the program that just sending one part of it to finance to make a recommendation on seems like a target to, well, we don't want that frequency. We want a different frequency instead of we're concerned about the whole cost of this bylaw as a whole. And if you're concerned with the cost of the bylaw as a whole, you should be seeking a recommendation to refer to finance for a recommendation on the bylaw and its implementing regulations as it relates to the cost of the bylaw and then finance could come back with, you know, maybe it's too expensive, we support the bylaw, but maybe you need to find a way to reduce costs, here's some options. And then if the whole council wants to reduce those costs with those options, it can go back to a committee that has spent the time drafting the language and knows all of the intricacies about the ins and outs and what fits with what to make sure that any amendments fit with each other. And I just want to point out one more thing. The current cost of the current program is 150 some thousand dollars. That's in our current operating budget. And so the estimated $450,000 cost is not an increase of $450,000 to our budget. It's actually only an increase of about 300 because that's the cost of this bylaw, not this bylaw in addition to what we're already spending on the current bylaw. So, so we just need to be clear when we're talking about numbers, how we're referring to the cost of the program as it relates to the current budget. Thank you. Kathy. Um, oh, I clearly misunderstood that you didn't want me to go narrow. You wanted me to go broad. I, I originally said, 3.50 residential rental property regulations and any aspects with cost implications. That's the way I wanted to word it. Um, and I thought I was being told too broad. All I was trying to do is not have it be just the fees. So any wording that brings in 3.50 residential rental property, which Paul said we have to bring it in if we want to talk about it at all, I'd be fine with. I wasn't choosing just the frequency because yes, Mandy, I completely agree. Other aspects, these, these are interacting parts. You know, how long do you have a permit for? Is one permit good for two years, three years, four years, five years? So I'm happy to amend my own wording to say the entire 3.50 residential rental property regulations as they relate to costs. I think you want to say bylaw and regulations. Bylaw and regulations. Thank you. Who seconded I, that? Anna. Anna, do you agree with that amendment? I do. Oops. Yep, I do. Okay. Uh, Mandy Joe. So it's not the the problem is as it relates to cost that we don't we don't ever said we say a recommendation you know this one says a recommendation on the fees to charge because we're actually asking you to come up with the fees but normally it's a report and recommendation. And finance's role would be to recommend whether the council should adopt the bylaw in light of what it might add to the budget or not, not refer the bylaw to look at specifically. I don't know. I guess I'm I'm having problems with the as it relates to costs because I feel like that's sending the bylaw off to finance to start redlining the bylaw to fix the costs instead of making a recommendation on the language and saying, do we recommend you adopt this language be based on how much it will cost to implement? Or do we need to go back to someone and say, you need to find a way to reduce the costs? I'm, I'm missing the nuance here, but I would be happy with any language that allows the Finance Committee to look at 3.50 residential rental property proposed by law. Any wording that doesn't say just the fee thing. I don't care what the wording is. That's all I'm trying to get is the leeway, the permission 
to look at that, whether we look at it or not. But I'm, as as Michelle said, we're only going to look at it for financial implications and budget implications. We're not going back to the drawing board on this. So, so Lynn, I, I'm kind of at a loss. I I'm happy to word it any way. There's been anything. a motion. Yeah, we did. We already have um, a motion that was amended with a friendly amendment. Paul, could you come back with a motion? Well, I actually need the friendly amendment more ex explicit. All right. So the initial motion is to refer to the Finance Committee the documents titled Rental Registration Fee Schedule Proposed Revision 6B 2023-08-03 and Fee Schedule Samples 2023-08-03 for a recommendation on the fees to charge under general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property and proposed and proposed I have to find my Sorry. proposed regulations for general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property and proposed revisions to general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property and the proposed regulations for general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property. For regarding frequency of inspections. No, that's what Mandy doesn't want. She wants want that. She wants that last phrase. She wants it to be. Uh, okay, can I make the suggestion? Because Kathy yes. language. For a recommendation on cost implications. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And Anna, you're still with us on that one? Yes. Still with you. Okay. Um, Michelle, you have your hand up. I was simply going to broaden it even a little bit more and take it right from our charge, which um, is to say, um, with regard to the effect the measure will have on town revenues, expenses, or finances. Um, to get that word cost out of there and and look at it from that more holistic um, lens that's uh, um, aligned there with our charge. But Kathy, if I don't know, I, if, I, my sense is that the the charge for the committee means exactly that. Yeah. And so, is there any anybody want to go along with any further changes on this? Seeing none. Okay, are there any questions? Paul, can you read the motion? <laughs> You're gonna to need to correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, I mean, I'll read the entire motion. So, so I'm gonna read the amendment because that's what we were voting on. We're just voting right. on the amendment, that's right? Correct. So the main motion is printed on the motion sheet um, and it's to be amended by Kathy's motion seconded by Anna to say, and proposed revisions Oh, God, my writing. Um, Proposed revisions to general bylaw 3.50. Residential rental property. And the proposed regulations for general bylaw 3.50. Residential rental property. On cost implications. Cost implications. All right, that is the, we are voting on the amendment to the motion, okay? That is the amendment to the motion. Any further questions on the amendment to the motion? If not, I'm going to start with uh, Mandy Jo. Aye. Uh, Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. I'm an I, but I did have a question that I raised before you called the vote. Um, but Sorry. Um, I just want to ensure that this uh, the the language that we're using allows us to look at not only the cost negative in implications, but all implications that the bylaw mm -hmm. will have. Okay, yes, it does so your vote? Oh, I'm an I. Yes, I'm an I. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yeah. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Patty Angelus. Aye. 
on a Devlin Goth here. Aye. And Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Now we go back to the original motion. The original motion combines all of the financial documents and the bylaws and the regulations for cost implications. Does anybody need me to try to read the whole thing? Okay, none. Then we're going to start with the vote, Anika Lopes. Anika, do you have a question? I'm sorry, my audio went out for a moment. Oh, okay. Um, we're now voting on the motion that includes the referral to the finance committee of all of the financial documents, as well as the bylaws and regulations for the purpose of looking at cost implications for the town. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Did you say no? I said yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. I'm um, somebody needs to mute, please. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmium. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Goth here. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, we have uh, pulled from the consent agenda was the authorization of the president to sign a letter in support of the act to modernize funding for community media programming. Mandy Jo, you asked to be pulled. Please speak to your um, request. Yeah, um, I had a couple of questions about the bill itself because the, the letter would have the council supporting the bill. And I, I thought this was a major bill that we should actually discuss before we just throw on consent support of the bill. It might not seem major, but um, you know, right now the the state's bills are recognition that cable service subscriptions are going down and the revenue generated from them are going down. And so how else to potentially support public education and government access channels on cable, I guess. Um, because they get, you know, or where else they could be distributed, right? Um, and my concern with this bill, and I have a concern with it as to potentially supporting it, is right now the the way cable fees are distributed and collected are negotiations between the mostly negotiations between the municipality, direct negotiations between the municipality and the cable operator under a franchise fee. And the municipality can negotiate up to a 5% um, of their, um, of the monies um, licensing requirements can be up to 5% of the cable operator's annual gross revenue from operating in the municipality. And that up to 5%, depending on the negotiation, would go all to the municipality. And um, I'm sure Andy can correct me if I'm wrong. And then the municipality does an RFP out to anyone who wants to apply for actually providing the PEG services. Right now, Amherst Media has won that RFP and is under contract to provide the services. And then Amherst, after collecting those 5% or whatever percentage we've negotiated, goes and hands, you know, pays Amherst Media some of that for that. There's also a 50 cents to the town for each subscriber as part of a regulatory fee and the state gets 80 cents of that. But the current bill that we're being asked to support would distribute the revenues statewide. It would be a statewide revenue, 5% of every subscriber, I guess, in the state. And 20% of that statewide 5% would go to the state. 
Um, 40% would go to the municipalities based on population, not on subscribers. And the other 40% would go directly to community media centers, again, based on population, not subscribers. And the so the bill itself is written on how the money is distributed concerns me, and it makes me wonder whether I actually support that distribution versus a different distribution, which is why I'm not sure I'm ready to pass off on a letter that supports the bill. Okay. Are there other, other comments regarding this? Um, do you, Mandy Jo, do you have a suggestion of any changes or is it just whether or not um, you would authorize the president to sign a letter? I mean, in some sense, it's that I, I would probably vote against authorization because I'm not sure this is the right bill. Okay. Dorothy, you have a question? Um, yes, um, I have to agree. I don't understand the implications of the letter. I mean, Mandy Joe raised a lot of interesting points, and I don't know how, how would this be similar to what we have now, how it would be different, um, nor how it works. I mean, I understand percentage of subscribers because then there's some connection between money that's made in the town and money that is given to the town um, by population. Then who, where's the money coming from? It's just, I, I just didn't follow it, but th that's my point. Thank you. Andy? No, I'm glad Mandy has raised these questions because, uh, you know, it does, um, the, change how the uh, money that goes from cable subscribers as it's expanded to include um, uh, web-based services providers in addition um, as an addition and how that whole system works and it's it's difficult and there are multiple pieces to it. One is, is the, uh, to figure out how the arithmetic works out for um, Amherst as a community that we're ultimately caring about and supporting this. Um, and the second uh, the re reality is, is that our senator, who's been very supportive of us on a number of issues, is, a co is, is the sponsor of the bill in the Senate side. And, uh, you know, so that there's a little bit of politics mixed up in this uh, whole question, too. Um, the only way to revise it would be to um, amend the letter. Um, and I don't know where the letter came from, but to amend the letter so that it's supporting the principle of um, expand, uh, that we support legislation that expands um, revenue base for um, that's available for cable services without getting into the actual specific bill. But if you do that, then do you have to get into being more specific as to what it is that your concerns are about the current legislation, even if you don't label it in that way? So it would really require that it go back somebody to revise the letter if we decide not to do it oh and i'll be glad to revise the letter or i will accept the council's uh, decision not to send the letter uh it was a request that came from amherst media um and it's parallel to an effort by senator markey at the federal level pam I had a question, maybe Paul could answer it. I, I just made a bad assumption that, that this was a replacement for the, what, $75,000 Comcast um, income that Comcast provides to the town and that this would somehow be a um, an alternate source for the same money, if you, if you could explain. No, I haven't read it closely, but I believe it's a new tax on streaming services. 
so the, the existing contracts with Comcast stay in place. But since those revenues are diminishing because people cut the cord, um, my understanding is that it's it's a new tax on you know the Netflixes and things like that. Right, Anna. You said this paralleled an effort on the federal level, and I wanted to just confirm, is that the same effort or a different effort uh, than the one that we put a letter for, forward in support of a couple months ago? Because um, I want to also be consistent with what we've supported in the past, which we did submit a letter of support for Community Television Act put forward by Senator Markey. Um, I don't remember what month that was, but it was a while back, and I just wanted to see, if, is that the same bill you're referencing here? It is the same bill, but I would actually like to now go back and um, review that. So I'm going to suggest that I take this, withdraw this item, do that um, comparison to what we did before. Uh, and thank you for remembering that. Okay. I wrote that one, so I remembered it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and hopefully I can find it before Athena returns. I can find uh, it. <laughs> Okay, good. All right, so I'm taking this one off of, off of the agenda until we get that comparison. Okay. Um, with that, we are finished with the votes. Let me go to my script. Um, if I can just find it. Oh, there it is. Um, we don't have any appointments. Uh, CR uh, committee and liaison reports. CRC, Mandy Jo. I think you've probably heard enough from us for today. <laughs> We're moving on to this. It's been a very productive night for CRC. Uh, elementary School Building Committee, Kathy. Uh, we have a full committee meeting coming up on August 18th, Friday at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, we are at a point of a lot of design details have been done, and they're pulling together all the information they need to go before the planning board and the conservation committee. So what the Friday meeting on the 18th will be is summarizing for all committee members, some of the decisions that have been made or recommendations that have been coming from subcommittees to pull it all together the, from the design team. Okay, Andy, finance committee. Yes, uh, after reporting for several meetings in a row that we were taking a break after uh, the torturous May and June meetings, uh, we're now back to meeting again. And as you've heard, it's August 22nd. I just wanted to share with you uh, what the proposed um, agenda is right now, though it hasn't been posted yet, and it's going to be subject to some changes uh, as we get to the final posting uh, process. but. Um, one thing we always do in September is to take some time at a meeting to review the budget process that we just completed um, in June and to make recommendations for the next year's budget process. Um, and we're moving that up to August um, because of uh, change in staffing in the finance department and uh, feeling that we need to work with current staff to uh, have that discussion. So that's item one. Item two is to um, review the um, FY24 budget. Um, now that we're at a point where we are um, have the budget as state budget is passed by the legislature in May by the time we meet, have some indication of what the governor has done with the budget and uh, what overrides seem possible if there are vetoes that affect the, the revenue that would be otherwise coming to the town. So that, that would be a second item. A third item is um, to take an advantage of um, our staff member who's leaving us to do one last round of discussion with him about the uh, financial projections for the four major building projects. And the last two items are the two items that we have already discussed in this meeting, the rental registration bylaw and the um, financial consequences of the streetlight policy. So it's gonna be a pretty 
um, complete agenda and we're going to have to make some choices as to how much time to we can spend to each item and what are the um, highest priorities for use of time but that is what the agenda is for um, at least tentatively for the meeting okay uh gol pat yeah, I think the uh, memo that I submitted is pretty, uh, has most of the information. We're continuing our review of the rules of procedure. The, and um, we are, we've been focusing a lot on uh, public uh, participation and conduct, not public conduct, but conduct of public counselors, uh, presenters, guests, et cetera. Um, and um, I think the other, you know, you, you, we did the um, resolution in support of trails. We have the town, uh, the clerk of the council submitting um, suggestions on some of the rules around agendas, et cetera, which has been uh, really the first time that that's happened. And it's really exciting to have her participation. Um, and the other thing is that we are having a second uh, uh, legal review of the uh, ensuring safe access to legally protected reproductive and um, gender affirming health care that proposed by law. Uh, there have been some changes. We want the uh, legal review there. And then the other thing is that we realized we need to have some way of getting feedback uh, from the school uh, department, from the superintendent about whether or not the bylaw is consistent with the plan he's presented to the school community about lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, queer, plus um, students, both, the, both their treatment and safety. And we've requested uh, in, uh, some kind of feedback or meeting with the library trustees and director to get an understanding about whether they would be able to apply these rules. Um, so it's been kind of interesting. Uh, to look at, to, to begin to stop siloing a council decision and open it up to other people that it, the decision could impact. Jones Library Building Committee, Anika. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend the last meeting, so I will uh, defer to Paul. And also knowing that TSO is coming next, we all know that the agenda item will be welcoming back. Uh, we have also not met since our last meeting. Our next meeting will be August th Thursday, August 31st. Okay, Paul, did you have a comment on the Jones Library building? Committee? And I wasn't at that meeting either, so. Okay. We'll uh, have the minute, the the, meet, the minutes will be coming and, and make sure to uh, give us a report at the next meeting. That's July 27th is when they met. Okay. Uh, AHRA, Michelle has uh, had to leave. In fact, the minutes should note that she left right around 10 o'clock. Um, liaison reports, any liaison reports at this time? Uh, Dorothy. Um, just a, a brief report that um, CSSJC is um, interested in learning more about plans for the youth center and interested what is in learning out what is the plan for uh, finding a new police chief. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other liaison reports? Uh, we've approved the minutes. Paul, are there any highlights you want to give us? I know this is not a written report meeting. Yeah. There are a few, if people are able to wait for a second to add. So a few things that are coming up, just a preview. Uh, we have a ribbon cutting for the Pomeroy Village uh, roundabout that we're, we'll be trying to schedule when we get our state officials in town. Um, we want to do a groundbreaking for Centennial uh, Water Treatment Facility. We're looking at August 24th for that, once we get confirmation again from the state officials. Um, the, on Saturday is the Community Safety um, Day at the Mill River. I think it's from 10 to 2, and that's where they have all kinds of activities with police, fire, crests all being there. Um, you can mark, you'll get a, you'll be getting an invitation soon to the university's um, community breakfast, which will be August 29th, although I haven't seen it in writing, that's what I've been told. So, um, 
in terms of the the and then uh then the, the big thing is of course our finance director has resigned his last day on the job will be august 30th um it's very um it can be a very impossible act to follow uh because he brought such a unique set of skills and um uh, abilities but we will talk more about that um at a future date and we're sure that he'll be at your next meeting we'll come up with something to make sure he's there okay um we'll come up with something we can always come up with something uh shalini you had your hand up mm -hmm. yes, i need to sign off but before i do uh, uh paul can you let us know if the rfi is being submitted for the new scholars it has not gone out yet. Susan had some comments coming in. She's uh, at two o'clock this afternoon. She had a few things that she wanted to add. So that I think Guilford was going to incorporate them to see how quickly he'd get that turned around. Okay, okay. Anika. Good night, everybody. Good night. Anika. Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, quickly announce that our uh, Newest business edition, Carefree Cakery, will be having having their grand opening this Saturday. And Thank it is you. an all-day event. Okay. And Jennifer? Yeah, I just had two questions for Paul. Um, would, when the RFI goes out for the waste hauler, could you maybe just you know shoot us an email? Oh, sure. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, can, I, can, I can send it out to you. OK, that would be great. Thank you. And I also just wanted to ask if any decision had been made about the buried line coverage. Yes, we have. Uh, we've met with the company. Um, I'll, I'll be talking with Sean about that tomorrow. It, we've got a, a company who's able to do it. They think it takes about six to eight weeks to implement uh, in terms of educating people and putting it out there. So we can we can turn that. So within the next six to eight weeks, I think we can have that out. Oh, so that means it would actually be available for people in. Great. So, the, so a decision has been made to. We can offer that to people. To so offer. basically, it's private insurance that people would purchase, but the town would sponsor it. We would say we're off. We're suggest, we're sharing the information out to everyone. So in a sense, it, it has our imprimatur on it. It's a program that's through the National League of Cities that has received good reviews. So could we actually mention that in like to our district, you know, newsletter? Sure. Okay. Our intention is to so. offer that. Yeah. I mean, I, okay. we you might want to see what the details are before you look right. at it before you start yeah. to say it yeah because you don't want to be saying it's going to offer something that it can't and offer it's not. so yeah okay thank you Dorothy well that that was my follow-up um any estimate uh any estimate of how much uh they could cover well typically what they I think they there's a pro, their program of covers up to eight thousand dollars okay Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other, I have no report. Um, I'll be working on the agenda for the 21st, but let's leave that till then. Are there any other council comments? Seeing none, I'm Kathy. Oh, one more. Yeah, sorry, just a very quick one, Paul. Um, we, we're getting repeat um requests on when and if there would be a decision on what can be done up by the Cushman uh daycare child care center and I just I mean we're doing our best not to respond to those other than to say thank you for your comments but I mm -hmm. think we had a meeting and trying to figure out some kind of response would be great yeah. um I mean, as you know there's an issue that's come up with the town decision to move a bus stop and people are like who who made the decision and why is the question because it, it's out of control of zba but it's a question of where did that and can that decision be changed so those two things i realize you're you're way too busy to have this right no, but, you, so, but yeah so on the cushman you know that's on my list for guilford when we meet on wednesday on the bus stop um so that was part of a um, design of North Pleasant Street that was done many years ago. And as people are coming in and can do things, that was to relocate that bus stop to and provide for a pull-off area for the bus. PVTA has to approve it. Um, but again, this, you know, um, if, if the council doesn't want to relocate that bus stop, it can revisit that, that decision made 
previously. I think it was, I think it actually was a select board decision, quite honestly, or a review of it. I'm not sure exactly how it developed, but I think they, what the, what the plan has been is like right now, the bus stop, the bus stops right in the middle of the road and people, and they, and the PVT is always asking us to find places where they can pull off so they can get their bikes this, safely and stuff like that. This is one that, that answers my question. It's, I, I know that longstanding policy. Um, so we probably should revisit it. I, not just about the bus stop, but it, we saw, we had a glimpse of it three years ago. <laughs> But thank and, you. And I think this is coming back to the ZB at the end of September or something like that. Okay. Are there any other counselor comments or questions? Seeing none, the meeting is adjourned at 1028. Yeah. Thanks. Nice job, Lynn and Paul. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Anna.